Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 2 of what if I was reincarnated in the DC universe with the avatar of the last airbender system. Let the tale begin. Chapter 26 Learning from Black Canary Aiden's P.O.D. So, Black Canary slapped her palms together. Simple explanation, sound is produced when an object vibrates and transmits that vibration through a medium. Be it air, liquid or solid at the speed of sound. She explained while I remained attentive, listening to her. The others had left the training room for the beach, but I had elected to stay behind and take advantage of Black Canary's offer to give me some tips. My canary cry can reach devastating levels that can not only be used to gravely injure someone but also kill them. Her face turned stern. I'm telling you this to let you know the dangers of going overboard. Past a certain point, it stops being sound waves and becomes shock waves. Strong enough to demolish concrete and liquidify organs. I nodded, knowing she was being serious. Her full power in the comics could reach 300 decibel. That's more than the force of a nuclear bomb. At that level though, I think she would also die along with whatever she aimed the attack at. If I could master the ability to produce destructive hypersonic sounds like Black Bolt then, not many could stand in my way. I could truly be the strongest person on this version of the DC Earth. Imagine having the power to produce nuclear bomb level shockwaves by a single action. Such an ability however would need to be a trump card of sorts. The question remaining is, what made me confident that I could reach Black Bolt's level of sound manipulation? Simple, I had recently tested myself and found out my reserves didn't deplete. The system refined energy from the blind realities, then fed it to me. That line had never been exhausted. No matter how many wind constructs I had created what got exhausted first was my body. Couple that with my adaptive physiology and with enough time, I would be a scary foe to face. The avatar system was effing OP. Let me demonstrate with this sheet of metal. She lined up the sheet with one of the dummies and stepped back 10 meters away. Now you can choose to make your sonic blasts concentrated for more focused damage or spread out in an area of effect attack. She opened her mouth and screamed. The air shuddered as invisible rings of vibration propagated from her mouth to land on the sheet. A circular hole appeared in the middle of the metal. Black Canary stopped and screamed again. This time the sound waves were bigger the further they traveled from her mouth. The metal sheet warped upon itself and was thrown away together with the dummy. Wow. I said before I could help myself. That's some phenomenal control you have there. Canary placed a hand on her hip and smiled at my comment slash compliment. Years of practice. All right, now it's your turn. I held up my hands a little unsure. I still don't really understand how to trigger it. Sensing things through the vibrations in the air is the only thing I've managed so far. Canary nodded in understanding while holding her chin. You have a point, your abilities don't come from a metagene like mine do. They are just an extension of your air control. Tell you what, why don't you go with your gut? I looked at her a little speechless. Go with my gut? Shrugging Canary explained. It's your body. No matter what instructions I give you, your intuition and instinct is what will help you. Oftentimes when metas manifest their abilities, it's because of distress. In such a highly emotional state, your logical thinking takes a step back. There is no manual for this Aiden. So trust your gut. I nodded, though a bit unconvinced. Another metal sheet was placed before me. I maintained the same distance that she had, roughly 10 meters and breathed in while focusing before me. I was a bit frustrated because sound hadn't come as easy as flight. With flight, things were straightforward, feel the air and then manipulate it to carry you forwards. Easy peasy. Except, it wasn't easy peasy. At least not if I tried to put it in exact terms or explain it to somebody. I hadn't followed an instructional manual or learned it from someone else either, it had just come to me. I felt like slapping myself after coming to the startling conclusion that I mastered flight by exactly how Black Canary said, through instinct. I looked at the sheet of metal, emboldened. Okay, here goes nothing. 
I pulled at the energy that allowed me to control the elements and pictured a blast of sonic waves leaving my mouth to destroy the target before me. My head was thrown back as a sonic scream left my mouth, intense and uncontrolled. The sound blasts hit the ceiling above as and created cracks on the natural cave surface, throwing stones and dust away. I shut my mouth and looked up from my position on the ground in marvel. Did. My voice croaked as I felt a dryness in my mouth. Woo, her. I motioned to Black Canary who threw a bottle of water over at me. Easy. Take it easy. The first time is always like that, but it gets better. I wiped my mouth and started laughing. That was amazing. I followed my gut just like you told me and it worked. She patted me on the shoulder. Well done. Also, Green Lantern will have your head for the damage. They spent a lot of time stabilizing the cave to ensure it didn't fall on our heads. Black Canary told me cheekily, relishing the look of panic that crossed my face. John wouldn't, right? John was a stern guy that reminded me of my grandpa who had also been in the military. Canary chuckled. Don't worry about it, I was just joking. I overplayed my relief making her smile some more. Canary had a pretty smile. I was also wondering why she was being so nice to me after I'd confronted Speedy in front of everyone. Green Arrow sure hadn't looked too happy and they were dating. I shook my head to get rid of those thoughts and turned to the intact metal sheet. I could almost feel it gloating at me. Round 2 Hours later General P.O.D. Aqualad stepped out of the discreet out-of-service telephone booth and looked around. The gray sky of Gotham hung above his head and cast a depressing mood on the city. I'd never liked it here. Aqualad said out loud to himself, unaware he had an audience. Don't let Rob hear you say that. He'll have a few choice words for Atlantis. Kid Flash unexpectedly spoke up from atop a dumpster. Kid. Where is Robin and why did you two want to meet secretly away from the others? Aqualad inquired from the yellow-clad speedster. Kid Flash shrugged his shoulders. Hey, I'm in the dark like you. Biscuit? He offered but Aqualad shook his head. Kid Flash took that as a signal to start munching. They silently made their way to an unusual meeting point, an abandoned doll factory from before Batman took down Dollmaker. It provided privacy because not even hardened criminals, let alone the homeless, wanted to go there. People said the place was infested with ghosts. Aqualad and Kid Flash soon found themselves on the roof of the building. Where is? Something detached from the wall and unfurled its cape, revealing Robin. Were you followed? Aqualad and Kid Flash stared at each other. No. I don't know. They answered respectively. What? I had to buy a snack from the store, someone definitely saw me, so I can't be a hundred percent sure I was not followed. Kid Flash answered upon the look given to him by the boy wonder. Robin, why did you call us here? Aqualad asked, changing the subject. Robin's hands ran through the wrist computer on his right hand before looking up. There, I surveyed all the cameras leading here. You weren't followed. And to answer your question, Calder, all this cloak and dagger stuff was necessary. I have reason to believe that Aiden is hiding something huge from us. Something that could put not only the team but the whole world in danger. Kid Flash and Aqualad stared at the boy wonder in shock. Robin, this isn't a joke. Are you being serious? Yes, Rob. We've had issues with Aiden, but that's all in the past. Are you sure you're not grasping at straws because of that? Kid Flash added to Aqualad's question. No. I've felt suspicious of him for some time now. Ever since he showed up out of nowhere when Batman and I were fighting Penguin's men, his crazy power and how he seems to just keep on getting better and stronger, even his actions when he took the blockbuster formula, Aiden Strong is not who we think he is. And we're going to get the proof. Aiden's P.O.D. A light knock sounded on my door. Luckily, I was just coming out of the shower. I turned down the volume of the music and went towards it, opening the door wide while drying my hair with the towel. Oh, hey, Artemis. Hey, can I? Oh. She cut off her statement halfway, furiously blushing. 
Please don't do the weird cliché thing where you feel shy because I'm shirtless. I told her while rolling my eyes. I'm not the one who came to open the door while half-naked. She shot back, scandalized. So what was I supposed to do, huh? Keep you waiting for five minutes? I crossed my hands together, an action that emphasized my chest and Artemis almost fainted. I chuckled in amusement. Teasing people was fun. I, uh, you're not, not that, hot. She stammered. Okay, I've officially broken our resident archer. Batman's gonna kill me. You know what, I'm going to go put on something before you pass out completely. Come on in. I told her and left the door wide open. I threw on a black t-shirt which matched with the blue shorts I had on and looked back at Artemis who was studying my makeshift studio. Gan told me you make music and that you're a great singer. I smiled. She did? Artemis nodded before bringing a finger to her chin in contemplation. Then again, Gan is probably the nicest person I know. She could be saying that to spare your feelings. That's true I guess but... I went closer to her and placed a hand on the guitar on the table behind her. Artemis gulped at the closeness. Maybe I can prove to you just how good I am. Chapter 27 An Unexpected Meeting Part 1 General P.O.V. Artemis gulped while trying her best to hide the loud and erratic beating of her heart. There was a hot boy, a really hot boy close to her. It wasn't her first time being this close to a good-looking boy before but Aiden was somehow different from the rest. He was quiet most times, funny when he wanted to but above all, real. She would be the first to admit that he was very attractive but she couldn't let him know that she was susceptible to his charms. She placed her palms onto his chest to push him away, but found herself fascinated with the rock-hard yet pliable flesh. Artemis unconsciously squeezed, lost in admiration. She heard a throat being cleared and looked up at Aiden, who had a lazy smile on his face and a raised eyebrow. Sexual harassment is a thing you know. He said, making Artemis stiffen in embarrassment. I, ah, uh, saw a lint on your t-shirt and was removing it for you. Nothing else. Aiden decided to spare her and nodded along. Sure, let's go with that. Artemis felt like wiping that smug smirk off his face with a punch or a kick or a kiss. She pinched her thigh. Get it together. Aiden reached out towards the guitar behind her and pulled back from Artemis' personal space. Artemis breathed out a simultaneous sigh of relief and disappointment. Inside her mind, she raged at her hormones. The soft tones of a guitar playing pulled her out of her thoughts. Then Aiden began singing. Artemis found herself entranced by his voice and the lyrics flowing from his mouth. The song itself brought out intense emotions in her. Loving can hurt, loving can hurt sometimes. But it's the only thing that I know. When it gets hard, you know it can get hard sometimes. It is the only thing makes us feel alive. We keep this love in a photograph. We made these memories for ourselves. Where our eyes are never closing. Hearts are never broken. And time's forever frozen, still. So you can keep me. Inside the pocket of your ripped jeans. Holding me closer till our eyes meet. You won't ever be alone, wait for me to come home. Aiden's soothing voice was enchanting. Artemis was amazed at how someone could possess such a great singing talent. The song was way different from what she had heard before. She walked as if in a trance towards the bed and sat beside him, her eyes never leaving his face, and when he was done, Artemis finally accepted what she had been trying her hardest to ignore. She had a crush on Aiden. Aiden's P.O.V. I finished singing Photograph by Ed Sheeran and turned to my audience. I was a little confused by the faraway look on her face and snapped my fingers to catch her attention. Hey, so how is it? I asked her. The ego boost was always welcome. That was, that was really great Aiden. You have a magical voice. Thanks. I smiled at her. I've been practicing really hard. Music speaks to me. When I'm feeling down, I just get my guitar and after playing something, 
all my worries melt away and I feel free. I wish I had something that did the same for me. She said a little sad. I envy you, Aiden. Sometimes I wish I could just sink into something so deep that I forget everything else. I didn't say anything, only nodding to let her express herself. She is my sister. Artemis revealed. At my confused look, she sighed and continued. Cheshire, she's my sister. I of course already knew that but a look of surprise crossed my face. Oh. I guess it makes sense why you asked me to let her go. Artemis turned to me, guiltily. I am really sorry for putting you in such a position, Aiden. It's just that the others wouldn't have trusted you if they knew that your sister was part of the bad guys. I know. She nodded and pulled her legs close to her body. Her voice was small as she continued. It's not just her. My dad, he's sportsmaster. I heard that you guys captured him and you can't imagine how relieved I was to know that, that he wasn't out there anymore. That he wouldn't keep on hurting people for selfish reasons. She wiped away a lone tear from her cheek and barked out a laugh, not looking my way. You must think, I'm pretty pathetic. Two of my family members are villains and instead of following in their footsteps, I'm here with you guys playing hero. I placed a hand on her shoulder, trying to comfort her. No, I don't. I think it's admirable. You chose to take a different path. A selfless path. A path that is really hard in a bid to do what you can to offset the actions of your fucking and sister. It's fucking inspiring. You're not playing a hero Artemis. To me, you are one. She was bewildered for a moment before a smile threatened to split her face in two. Thank you. Thank you for not judging me harshly, although that's what someone else in your position would have done. I shrugged. Trust me, the last person with the right to judge anyone is me. We all have our secrets, Artemis. I responded, intentionally being cryptic. She looked at me weirdly, before she realized what I was getting at. Are you talking about your extracurricular activities? You know the underground fights? She whisper shouted at me. Why are you whispering like that? I poked fun at her, whispering back. Artemis punched my shoulder and I chuckled. You didn't deny it. You know, the underground fight thing. She relented making me sigh. It was meant to be practice on how to handle my super strength. So that's why, you didn't go all out in our fight from the start. Artemis added making me nod. Due to my powers, it's really hard for me to lower my strength completely. So when I'm in the ring, every move I make I try to back it up by skill and not brute force. It's good practice to make sure I don't injure someone while we're superheroing. I explained, further adding, plus it's really hard to get a no-hold-bars type of spar while training with the team. Artemis winced, no doubt recalling the pain from my fist landing on her belly the first time we fought. You could have fooled me. That blow was hard. I laughed at her expression and apologized. We stayed like that for a few more minutes, just talking about ourselves. She opened up to me about her mom who was a former criminal along with her dad but was now stuck in a wheelchair. I told her about my fear of fucking up and disappointing those who believed in me and by the end of it all we had grown closer. Look at the time. I should get going. She told me while getting up. Thank you. She gestured around. For all this. The talk, the singing. I really needed it. I got up, placing the guitar back on my bed. No worries. What are friends for? She cocked her head and tried to tease me. Friends? My oh my, aren't you moving a little too fast? I'm not the one who's leaving my room at nine o'clock. If anyone sees you, what do you think they'll say? The resident archer's face went red. That's, that's not. Good night. She opened the door and escaped closing it behind her with a bang. I listened to her walk away before the smile slipped off my face. Artemis had come here to tell me about Cheshire in hopes that I would sympathize with her sob story. It wasn't quite manipulation but I wonder what would have happened that day had I decided not to let Cheshire go. I cut off that train of thought and looked at the time, confirming once more that it was near 10 o'clock. 
Tonight was the night I had decided to go to L.A. and hit some of its underground fights. I changed my clothes into a black hood, jeans, and a mask which went to my pocket then left my room silently. My feet padded the halls of the cave softly until I arrived before the Zeta Boom tube and used it. I had done extensive research on the differences between my version of L.A. and this one and the truth was that they were very different. Probably, as a consequence of the impact of a superhuman society. A nostalgic feeling overcame me as I breathed in the L.A. air, the Zeta Boom tube emptied out into a street that was fortunately near a nightclub that hosted underground illegal fights for the wealthy and influential. The name of the nightclub was Sunset Blooms. It had been a bitch and a half to get that information by the way because the fights were brutal. I'm talking death and grievous injuries brutal. There were two parts of entry to the nightclub. One was the main entrance for those people out to have a good time, unaware of the frankly dark shit going on under their feet and the other were part of the darker side of the city. The ones with a unique taste. A taste for violence. It was strangely comforting to see the darker sides of the city were still the same. I made my way towards the back entrance and tapped for consecutive times on the iron door. The door opened after I gave a unique phrase to the guy manning it. A guy who had a gun strapped to his hip, which further cemented the fact that I was in the right place. I went down the stairs as a loud cheering got louder and louder with every step until finally I found myself in a crowded space with people surrounding a ring. A ring that was wet with blood. Elsewhere, General P.O.V. In the continuity that Aiden was familiar with, he left his post a year from now in 2011. Having decided to retire from the fiery pits and indulge himself in the pleasures of the human world. However, in this continuity, he got tired of hell much earlier and so, the devil, Lucifer himself left for earth and as a consequence, nothing would ever be the same again. Chapter 28, An Unexpected Meeting Part 2 General P.O.V. An alert appeared on the back computer's screen. Batman clicked on it and narrowed his eyes. Someone had used the Zeta tubes in the cave to go to a non-prioritized zone, Los Angeles. He accessed the surveillance footage to find out who it was while having his suspicions already. Maelstrom the Dark Knight found he was right on the mark when he saw Aiden dressed in a baggy hoodie use the Zeta tubes moments after Artemis did the same and leave for Gotham. The Dark Knight could already guess why Aiden had decided to go to L.A. Truth be told, he'd expected it. Sooner or later, the displaced teen would feel the urge for some semblance of familiarity and going to his city of origin despite it being just an alternate of the real Los Angeles would provide it. Batman decided to take a wait-and-see approach something he had been doing a lot these days. He just hoped that he would get the answers he was looking for soon. As the world's greatest detective, it bothered him that he didn't have all the cards. Aiden's P.O.V. I cracked my knuckles as my first match began. The floor was sleek with blood as mentioned earlier and as I stepped forward, a scanning device washed over me to test for the metahuman gene. Call it bloody, ruthless, and dangerous, but the match executives tried to make it fair. I eyed the device with a critical eye. It wasn't sleek like LexCorp equipment and neither was it efficiently made like Wayne Tech products either. If anything, it looked constructed out of poor materials. Like a prop you would expect from an 80s sci-fi B-movie. A smile split my face into two, clearly the work of a genius. Building something that could read deep into a target's body and see if they had the metagene in their D.N. wasn't something just anyone could do. Regarding the poor make of the whole thing, it meant that that person was severely lacking in funding. That meant they could be recruited. The device beeped an all clear and let me through. I didn't have a metagene and I wasn't an alien so it made sense I had been let through. Now if the device worked by studying the density of a target's muscle tissues or esoteric energy readings, that might have been a problem. I am going to break your bones and suck the marrow in them. My first opponent threatened, much to the uproar of the crowd. These people loved mayhem and were looking forward to one of us breaking the other. I took a second to study him. He was dressed in ripped jeans that had poorly washed bloodstains on them. Showing one, he had a poor sense of hygiene and two, this wasn't his first rodeo. His teeth were serrated, making his ugly face look even more menacing. 
Couple that with his crooked nose and you get a six, six-foot behemoth who literally ate people for breakfast based on his choice of words. I crack my neck and unzip the hood, leaving me in a black t-shirt, a matching pair of shorts and my mask that I had designed to look really cool. It had webs crossing its length in a Spider-Man suit theme. There was a chime and the match officially begun. Instantly, my whole demeanor changed. There was no backing down from this fight and I couldn't afford to get blindsided by not taking it seriously. The monster, believe it or not that was his moniker, advanced towards me with his hands apart and his tongue licking his serrated teeth. Someone else would have taken him for a joke but the fact that he had survived countless fights and was in this establishment that catered for the rich and powerful showed there was more to it. I studied him again while we circled each other. His foot shifted to the front slightly and there. I saw it, his stance was stable and his back muscles were probably ready to push him forward in great momentum. This guy was trained. And sure enough, I saw a fast punch headed towards my belly. An attack that anyone else except for someone good would have failed to block. I parried the blow to the side, pulled in close and chopped my palm onto his neck, cutting the blood flow to his brain. He stumbled back and took a knee to the blood-soaked floor. I didn't grant him any respite and my leg whipped out, catching him right on the side of the head with my foot and sending him to the ground. The monster passed out. There was a brief silence before the crowd went crazy. Kill! 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 I looked around in great surprise. Are they serious? Turning my attention to my opponent, I found him unconscious and helpless on the floor. How can they ask me to do something so deplorable? I raised my hand and prompted them to keep quiet. Once the crowd of hundreds of people was silent, I spoke up. I do not kill. Will not kill. Boo! Boo! Dollar carrot it. F asterisk CKU. A litany of insults was thrown my way as I left the cage. My surprise turned into anger. How many people have died here due to these people? It was fine with me if you break bones, but killing those who were out of the fight or didn't deserve it rubbed me the wrong way. Of course I knew I would have to kill eventually. The changes I wanted to bring about couldn't be done without a few truly evil villains dying. But senseless killing wasn't something I would condone. That's why when the booing and cries of kill didn't end, I decided on something someone else would call hypocritical. I was going to shut down this whole thing and steal their money. Unknown P.O.V. Maze dear, you feel that? The stench of a greedy little pig, so far away from home. A tall and very handsome man dressed in a tuxedo said to his companion. The man had black wings unfurled behind his back and a majestic aura surrounding his form. His companion on the other hand was a devilishly hot female. She was dressed in all leather and had a glint of menace and killer charm glowing in her eyes. She cocked her head to the side while looking down at the Sunset Bloom nightclub in a little interest. They were both standing on the roof of the building opposite the establishment. I've always wondered where that piece of hellhound crap, Galiel was. I was even looking forward to hunting him down and slowly slicing the skin from his bones. She stated while sliding her finger along the length of the sharp-looking dagger. The handsome man laughed. You're still mad at him even after three millennia I see. He commented while sparing his servant slash former lover slash best friend a glance. Mazikeen snorted. Isn't it the same for you, Lucifer? He abandoned his post. The now named gentleman shrugged his shoulders and answered smoothly. It's a matter of principle. You on the other hand are making it personal. This is the human world maze. I urge you to exercise a little bit of restraint. We don't want the same debacle with Hitler now, do we? Mays rolled her eyes. Oh, please, just because I gutted him and strained him up by his entrails, you all can't seem to forget that, can you? Mays, I'm the bloody devil and I understand eternal damnation and suffering, but that, that was just brutal. Mays spared him a smile. But you loved it. Lucifer sighed and matched the devilish smirk on his partner's face. I did. That said, I don't want to announce our presence too early. 
Otherwise, father might decide to send one of my brothers to come and run interference before I corrupt his precious pet project. Not that they need any corrupting, free will has done that splendidly. Fine. You're no fun today. Woke up on the wrong side of bed? May's teased to which he ignored and focused his attention on the nightclub before him. They would need a base of operations and a place such as this, filled with debauchery and the smell of sin was fitting, for him, he supposed. The fact that a former resident of hell, a demon by the name Galiel who had escaped hell a few millennia ago was the owner just sweetened the deal. Hey Mays, what do you say we crash a party? I thought you'd never ask. Galiel is mine. Aiden's P.O.V. I made my way towards the locker room. I didn't make eye contact with anyone and opened the door to the bathroom. I looked at myself on the mirror of the dimly lit room and breathed out. This wasn't going the way I thought it would. I couldn't stomach the thought of going back onto that ring again. Something was messed up in this place. It was clear. Much clearer now. The air itself was more oppressive inside this whole establishment than outside. I couldn't quite put a finger on it, but a malevolent aura pervaded the whole place. I wasn't unsure about my decision to shut this place down now. In fact, how about I start with a couple of idiots coming my way? The door to the bathroom opened and in walked Dumb and Dumber. Two generic men dressed in tight black shirts and trousers. They weren't normal either. A barely detectable scent of blood clung to them in a miasma that just screamed wrong. Is it a requirement for you to be big, ugly, and dumb to work here? I asked them, opening the tap and lightly washing my hands. My face scrunched up in distaste. Even the water was kind of murky. The first of the men ran his eyes up and down my form, a sickening and hungry smile appeared on his face as he started to talk. You're coming with us. The boss wants to see you. See what's behind the mask. Maybe understand what makes you think you're better than the rest and why you won't kill. The boss. That was, actually great. If I could get to him then I could take this whole thing down starting from the top. I turned to Dumb and Dumber. Okay, what are we waiting for then? Let's go. Chapter 29, An Unexpected Meeting Part 3 Aiden's P.O.V. I followed one of the two men out of the washroom silently. The other one was behind me to make sure I didn't decide to run. Which would have been the smart thing to do had I known what was to come. Unfortunately, I didn't. We weaved through throngs of people before using the stairs to go up to the V.I.P. viewing section. A few people pointed at me in distaste while the majority were focused on the fight happening between two women in the cage. One of them looked like a wrestler while the other moved with the grace of a cat. I narrowed my eyes. I could recognize the League of Shadows training in her. Interesting. Dumber pushed my shoulder from the back. Keep moving before I drag you there by your balls. His rancid breath made me scrunch up my nose in distaste. There's a little something called personal space dickhead. My elbow shot backwards and caught him on the solar plexus. Dumber wheezed in pain and stepped back but remained standing which greatly shocked me. The blow wasn't at full power but still. Anyone else would have already passed out. Yet he remained standing showing that he was strong or better yet, abnormal just as I had suspected. A gun dug onto the skin above my kidney. I stared at the goon who had been ahead of me. You think you're hot shit? Don't try that again if you know what's good for you. He intimidated me. Wow, a lackey that can snark back. I've seen it all now. Dumb used the gun to push me towards the door without commenting. Got to give it to him, he was very patient. Two guards were standing on the sides of the door, looking intimidating and dangerous. One of the two men leading me stepped up. Lord Galiel requested to see this man. The guards didn't comment but merely opened the door for me. Instantly, the smell of rotten eggs, blood and sulfur wafted out, making me stiffen and go on guard. Move. I won't tell you again. I stepped through with Dumb falling closer to me and found myself in a very classy room. The furniture probably cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and a huge TV screen was mounted on the wall, showing the fights happening on the ring in real time. 
The room had a balcony where someone could actually look down and see the fight from up here. No mistaking it, this guy was the boss indeed. I took time to study the man and found him to be less than impressive. He was fat. His huge belly protruding out of the red robe he wore. His nails were clean at least but his teeth were yellowed and rotten. He seemed to stand at just below six feet with matted black hair and pale skin. On the table before him was a white substance and a rolled-up dollar bill. One of the men pulled me down to a kneeling position like he and his partner to show respect, but I stayed upright, not budging an inch. Kneel, you fucking idiot. The gun dug into my side some more, but I showed no intention of following the order. Galiel raised up a hand and the goon went silent after muttering an apology. Galiel ignored us, using the dollar bill to snort the cocaine on the table. Meanwhile, I looked around some more and saw a peculiar painting with a few scuff marks on the sides of the wall it was placed on and muttered, Bingo! I'd found the safe. You are not normal. Galiel's voice was gruff and deeper than I had expected. He leveled a cold stare at me and motioned for the seat opposite him on the other side of the table. I went forward, pulled out the chair and sat on it before crossing my hands on my chest. Neither are you. Galiel's eyes widened minutely. Interesting. Then he added with a wave of his hand. Leave us. The guy I had hit with my elbow earlier didn't seem to like the sound of that. He stared at me with fury in his eyes. Master, I beg of you to let me kill him after you're done. His partner looked suddenly afraid as he moved a bit further away from him. You fool. He whispered low but just enough for my superior senses to pick up. You dare to defy me? The air in the room changed. Faster than I could react to, a blood-red circle manifested on the floor below the guy, who had now just realized he'd fucked up and flashed yellow. Before he had the chance to do anything, an explosion of fire swallowed him fully. A blackened skeleton fell to the ground and shattered into ash. My hands tightened on the armrest while I calmly tried to still my beating heart. That fire, whatever it was, was hot. It was hot enough that I felt I wouldn't survive having my whole body exposed to it despite my toughened skin. Maybe I was a little bit too hasty coming here. Hellfire. He explained, a little something I brought with me from home. He smiled slowly, waiting to see my reaction. Mitch. I hummed, denying him a glimpse into my real thoughts. Inwardly, though, my mind was in turmoil at the revelation. So this guy was a demon or at least claiming be one. This world was much, much stranger than I thought it would be. Galiel snapped his finger. Get our guest a drink. The special kind. He ordered while staring at me. This time his look changed to a disturbingly greedy one. Dumb looked unsure for a bit, but after remembering the death of Dumber, he hurried up to follow his master's orders, probably wary of meeting the same fate as his partner. I don't believe I have properly introduced myself. I'm Galiel, businessman extraordinary, collector of fine, specimens, and an amicable boss. I spared a glance at the blackened layer of soot at the irony of his statement. You forgot pyromaniac. He laughed at my words. You're funny. I like that. However, you need to know when to shut your mouth, brat. A heavy feeling fell upon my shoulders. It felt like telekinesis or some kind of energy, maybe magic? It wasn't a far-fetched based on the fact he just fried a man to ashes. Fortunately, it wasn't anything too oppressive, but I still groaned and sank into my seat all the same. I didn't want him to know I could shrug off his power with barely any effort. This had turned from a simple robbery into something else. I needed to know if I was looking at a full-scale demon invasion and why the Justice League or other affiliated heroes didn't know about what was going on here. Who are you? I bit out. Galiel rose up from his seat just as a goblet of a black substance was placed before me. The better question would be what I am. And that my soon-to-be underling is an opportunist. He went over to the balcony overlooking the fight happening downstairs. Human souls are infinite batteries of energy. That's why most of my kind covet them. However, what they all fail to see is the vitality you all possess. 
Not much when compared to other species, but humanity has them all beat on two fronts. 1. Your resilience in the face of dire straits makes your life force undergo a qualitative change and 2. The fact that you fuck and breathe like rabbits. The demon started laughing uproariously. That gives me an endless resource of mortal life force. Life force that I can then refine and turn into power. Power that I can then use to pay back. He stopped suddenly. That's none of your concern. No, you are here for something a bit more, different. I strained showing him that I was still under the effects of his power. You see, I lack talented fighters. Effective ones, in fact. Ever since the 20th century picked up with industrial and telecommunications growth, hiding my involvement in large-scale human deaths has become a rather tedious affair. These days, underground fight rings like these are the only way I can act without drawing attention from the supernatural side of things. He came over to my seat and sat on the table. Magicians are pesky little shits who poke their noses where they don't belong. Superheroes are no better either. So take this as an interview. I can sense a strength in you. Your life force is much greater than any human I've ever seen before. With you, I won't have to fear their interference and then I can act freely. You are my investment. He held my chin and turned me forcefully towards him. The goblet containing the black liquid appeared on his other hand. This will elevate you to the level needed to take on anyone. Even the big blue boy scout. He finished happily. I still had my reservations, but this was basically a free power-up. But first, I needed to know what it was. What is shit? I asked awkwardly, my jaw still in his hand. Hush. My minion and drink up. Wait. He brought the goblet up to my mouth, but the look of anticipation on his face changed when my hand came up and held his wrist. He cried out as I squeezed it painfully. My other hand took the goblet from him and placed it on the table. The skin of his left hand flaked off to reveal a scaly arm and huge claws. He swiped the dangerous-looking claws towards me but a quick tap on the elbow and the hand went slack, uselessly hanging from his body. Who are you? Galil shouted, fear coloring his voice. I sneered at him. First of all, you talk too much. Secondly, I said, wait you idiot. You are going to force-feed me some shitty-looking liquid without even explaining what it was. I increased the pressure on his palm making him cry out some more. Do you know who I am? I landed a slap on his jaw careful not to dislocate it for my next question but hard enough to show I wasn't playing around. What's that liquid made of? He stared me in defiance and started laughing. I have been the cause of the fall of so many civilizations, brat. You think you can threaten me to say anything? The door banged open and a group of guards appeared. Men! Open fire! Dum gave the order. I really need to stop calling him that. His lack of hesitation showed he had some brains. After all, I am fucking dangerous. I opened my mouth and produced a sonic blast at them. The concussive waves of sound threw them all back out into the hallway and shattered the doors into wooden chips. The wall surrounding the door had small cracks running up it as well. The crowd below started panicking and running away. Meanwhile I turned towards Galil and saw the wide-eyed look on his face. What are you? The reply came fast. Special. Chapter 30, An Unexpected Meeting Part 4 Aiden's P.O.V Now, I punctuated my statement by stomping on his leg and breaking it. Galil groaned in pain but otherwise kept silent. I felt a brief surge of respect for his resilience before remembering what he was. I won't ask you again. What's in the goblet? Clearly, I wasn't going to get through to him. Centuries had no doubt tempered his will to the level where a little pain just wouldn't cut it. That said, I wasn't worried about his retaliation through the explosion of hellfire from before because of how close he would be. If he activated the spell or whatever it was, even he would be blasted to kingdom come. So it was time to change tactics. I crouched next to him and brought my mouth close to his ears. I wonder what would happen if I informed Zatara of the presence of a demon who's been the cause of countless deaths and mayhem across history. 
Galiel's eyes widened in panic. No, you can't. I smiled and continued. Zatara likes to stack the odds in his favor so he would most likely come prepared and with some super backup. The League kind. I dug my fingers onto his shoulders and stared at him even more intensely. You would lose the fight. No question about it. And that would result in you getting deported back to hell, and from your earlier words, that's worse than a death sentence. Galiel was shivering non-stop by then. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you. He stammered out, the image of the defiant and stubborn demon from earlier completely gone. The goblet contains refined metahuman essence. I use the devices outfitted on both ends of the ring to detect metas and then afterwards kill and drain them of their vitality. I sucked in a deep breath. So, it wasn't to make the matches fair. It was a means to hunt down ability wielders. Why? Why target them specifically? I asked him the question, already suspecting what he would say. Quality. Human life force is not as potent as other races. That changes when the meta gene is introduced. Think of it as an elevator straight to the top floors. He smiled nastily. And I'm usually there to welcome them like a good host. My hand applied pressure to his clavicle and snapped it. Galiel shouted at the unexpected pain. He spared me a hate-filled gaze that I ignored. You deserve that and you know it. I commented on the broken clavicle. Next question, how many metahumans have you killed so far? He clenched his jaw, refusing to talk. You know, I have Zatara on speed dial. He looked at me skeptically, making me laugh. Okay, that's a lie. But trust me, getting him here is a simple matter of making a single call. You want to try me? Galiel huffed in frustration. Fine. Metahumans are rare. But occasionally one or two find their way to me. I cannot tell you the collect number, but it's less than five. Less than five, my black ass. Galiel was a demon. A demon's whole shtick was lying. Ipso facto Galiel was lying to me. Trying to downplay it. Last question. What will happen if I drink it? By now, almost everyone had cleared out but I could feel that something wasn't quite right. Where were Galiel's men? I had blown back Dom and the group from earlier but I knew that none of them had truly died. So what was the hold up? I have to finish this quickly, get the money and skedaddle. A glint of interest appeared on Galiel's face as he ran a curious eye around my form. To be completely honest, I don't know. The ones who have gone through the process before you awaken metagenes but their powers were either weak or incompatible with their bodies. So I changed things up a little and introduced something else into the mix. So this is not like the previous versions. It's untested. I narrowed my eyes at that. That sounds familiar. I've only had one successful meta with a useful ability and their power. At this point his smile was back needs to be handled with delicate care. After all, it is oh so useful. I narrowed my eyes. The meta gene scanning devices. The one who made them is that meta, isn't it? Probably someone with a technology intuitive ability. They were made shoddily, taking inspiration from LexCorp, Wayne and many other companies involved with superhuman response, support and detainment tech. Galiel's look of shock was priceless. I felt a brief surge of pride course through me at the lucky guess. It was a far-fetched guess, but Galiel struck me as the kind of perso, sorry, demon, who would use every advantage he got. So based on that fact alone, of course he would see the potential of someone with the ability to mishmash tech and create useful devices from poor materials. How? How do you know that? Did Raz al Ghul send you? That bastard. We had a deal. At the name drop, everything clicked. Raz al Ghul was part of the light. The light had access to Cobra Venom and the original blockbuster formula. I spared a look at the goblet once more. Galiel had said that this batch of meta essence was different from the usual one. It wouldn't be a stretch to think that he could have mixed it with Cobra Venom or blockbuster. I mean the light had done it already. 
Who says they wouldn't do so again? That said, I wasn't going to use it now. That would be dumb and pointless despite having access to an ability that ensured nothing would change with my body. More study needed to be done on the, what should I call it? Oh yeah, how about the Metatrigger? It's simple and precise. I looked around for a container of sorts and my eyes landed on an empty whiskey bottle. Not the ideal container but desperate times call for desperate measures. I turned my attention back to Galil who was still furious about Ra's al Ghul's supposed betrayal. I wasn't going to correct him though. Villains going at each other's throat was fine with me. What I was more interested in was the meta Galil had commissioned to build the metahuman scanning devices. Where are you keeping them? The meta who made those devices. Tell me and maybe just maybe we can renegotiate on whether I'll let you go or not. Fuck you. Here we go again. General P.O.V. Mays contemplated on following after Lucifer as he made his way towards the front door of the establishment but decided not to. She was more comfortable in the darkness. Millennia spent being the boogeyman to the sinners in hell had ensured that the shadows were a favorite place. Not because of the concealment factor but because of the philosophical nature of it all. People fear what they don't know. That fear, was deliciously satisfying when drawn out and intensified through a touch of mystery and suspense. With that she used the back door to infiltrate. Unseen and unheard except for the guard propped up on the wall with a slit throat. Lucifer never said anything about killing a single human. He'd said to keep their steps light and influence minimal. At least until they had their bearings right. To be honest, Mays didn't see much point in all of this. If you ask her, Whatever the boss was after on Earth, she was skeptical he would find it here. The city was sufficiently dark but not to the level of a few others. Plus the superpowered community would also be a problem if they crossed paths with them. Maze, however, was confident in Lucifer. He was the damn devil for crying out loud. His power was unfathomable. It didn't matter if he was currently suppressed to just above human in terms of strength. Maze's eyes lit up in a little interest as throngs of people started making their way outside the room while panicking. She pushed through the crowd and found herself before a cage that had patches of blood on the floor. Her eyes quickly ignored that to watch a contingent of guards ran up the staircase towards the V.I.P section. Galil. She muttered in excitement. I'll have to thin out the herd before he and I have a long overdue family reunion, she thought to herself and took a leap. Using her superhuman agility, Maze grabbed the frame of the staircase and hoisted herself up. She landed halfway to the top of the stairs and started going up. Suddenly, the foundations of the room shook following a huge explosion of sound. Maze stepped back just as the guards from earlier were blown back out of the room at the end of the hallway. She narrowed her eyes at the groaning men and stepped over them, knocking out those who were about to get up. Her hand shot out to block a stone-like limb from one of the men with her dagger. There was a loud ting. Sound following the clash and Maze flipped backwards to study her opponent. The man did not look injured despite the massive attack from before. His right hand grabbed the remains of his tight t-shirt and shredded it from his upper body. Are you with that guy? Answer me, bitch. He shouted and got mad when Maze cocked her head to the side in puzzlement. Fine. Don't talk, I like it that way. He licked his lips while running this perverted eyes down her body. Maze sneered. He would pay for that disgusting look. His skin turned to stone to resemble the hand he had used to block Maze's dagger with. The man stepped forward with a cry and threw a punch. Maze ducked under his arms and snaked her way up his body. Her legs locked around his neck in a tight grip. Maze twirled her two daggers and then dug them through her opponent's eyes. The man staggered with a shout of pain and knelt on the ground while spasming. Maze pushed them in deeper and a second later, the man's dead body fell onto the ground. Maze didn't spare a look at him and simply turned to stare at a dozen more guards who had surrounded her. The elevator from the main floor of the nightclub opened, revealing Lucifer. Getting inside had been a breeze. He had even taken the time to tour the place. Lucifer was thinking of turning this underground section into a cellar. However, he didn't see a point in changing the business. 
from what he had seen, the nightclub was successful. What he would change, however, was the name. He was thinking of calling it Lux. The sound of battle pulled him out of his thoughts. He smiled in amusement at the scene of Maze being surrounded by over a dozen of Galil's men. Someone else would be worried for her, but he knew that the ones at a disadvantage were the lackeys. Looks like she is enjoying herself. Chapter 31 An Unexpected Meeting Final Part General P.O.V. Two days ago, the reporter looked professional despite the destruction showing in the background. He looked at the cameraman and straightened out his tie to prepare himself to go live. And we're on in three, two, one. The signal was given and the reporter's face turned grim. His voice was smooth and even, delivering concise and precise sentences in a tone that forced you to listen intently. The mass destruction caused by the Terror Twins continues. Earlier today, the two twins found themselves in an altercation with the Flash after attempting to rob priceless gems. They managed to escape, but the Scarlet Speedster was able to retrieve the stolen gems. A picture showing two blonde twins, a girl and a boy appeared on the screen next to the image of the reporter. Lex Luthor placed a glass of wine back onto the table while humming in interest. His gaze stared at the two twins in thought before a small smile appeared on his face. Brutes whose powers are predominantly super strength with a below average intelligence level. No other outstanding qualities. Their personalities make them out to be brash and metas who mostly rely on their strength for everything. They are perfect to test him. He sipped his wine before abruptly getting up from his seat. He walked forward slowly towards the balcony of his penthouse and stopped, looking out over the city. A flash of red and blue cut through the air a ways off into the distance. Superman. Lex had only spotted him out of luck. Luther sneered at the retreating figure of the Man of Steel. Soon. Soon, you will reveal to the world what you really are. The folly of them treating you like a god shall be your ultimate undoing. And when that happens, when you get tired of hiding behind false morals, that will be the time that humanity no longer has a need for you. When that time comes, the gloves are off, Superman. Mark my words. Luther retreated back into his penthouse. There was a young Caucasian woman dressed in a formal suit standing next to his table. A small smile appeared back on Lex's face. My compliments to the chef, mercy, but I believe that's enough shrimp for the night. He stretched out his arms to the sides and mercy dutifully dressed him in his black tuxedo jacket. Lex straightened out his suit and buttoned up the jacket. Right now, we have somewhere else to be. Aiden's P.O.V. Okay, it's official. I'm bad at the interrogation thing. No matter what I did, Galiel refused to break and give me the information I wanted. I had already wasted too much time here. I wanted to be gone before anonymously giving a tip to the supernatural experts on the shit that had been going on here. I looked into the eyes of the demon and saw spite. I, I also felt dirty. His face was bruised. Teeth loose and nose broken. It was as if something primal had been born inside me and I couldn't stop myself from messing him up. I looked at the blood in my knuckles and swallowed the fear that something had changed within me. I've always known that my hands wouldn't be clean. Especially given what I intended to do. To truly bring change to this world, it had to reach the point where superheroes were no longer needed and to reach that point, I had to make sure that supervillains were stopped. The ones who could change would be redeemed and the ones who couldn't would die. It was the mission I had given myself due to the knowledge I had. The knowledge that ensured I knew a person better than even themselves due to studying their character and even alternate selves back in my old world. It sounds dumb and misguided. What made me think I had the power to impose my opinion onto others? To be truly honest, I wanted nothing more than to hold myself up in my uncle's studio and make music like before. Not having to stress about things like saving the world or crap like that. But I couldn't. The path I planned to walk would no doubt create enemies for me, but I was ready for that. Which is why, I couldn't falter. Not now or ever. My hand rose up while I stared at the groaning mess of the demon before me. More of his human skin had slouched off, revealing black scales across his body. 
a sheath of twisting wind appeared, covering my hand. I didn't look away. Galiel's eyes widened and he scrambled to get up, but I had used chi blocking on all of his limbs, so he floundered in place. Damn you, human! He bit out. The words were barely recognizable, however. I won't pretend to be the good guy. Taking a life whether that person deserves it or not is something that taints you. My jaw clenched. But to ensure more people are not hurt, that is a sacrifice I am willing to make. Goodbye, Galiel. My hand came down onto his chest and speared through his torso. Blackened blood burst out of his mouth and landed on my mask and clothes. They smoked as they melted from the acid like blood. I used my other hand to remove the mask. The wind attack sliced apart his internal organs from within, leaving a bloody mess on the ground. Galiel's eyes showed fear as he tried to mutter something. His blood flowed onto the carpet floor and neatly arranged itself into a pentagram. I quickly jumped backwards just as a blast of hellfire burst out of the pentagram below Galiel's body. No! Damn it! A sudden voice cut through the air, followed by a knife aimed towards my head. I ducked the attack, remotely registering the dull thunk of the projectile as it dug itself onto the wooden closet behind me. A woman walked calmly inside while twirling a dagger on her right hand. She was beautiful. She was also eerily familiar. You stole my kill. You shouldn't have done that. I'm not the sharing type. Fuck. That voice, the leather, the danger quality, sinfully sensual body, the daggers, L.A. and Galiel's demonic presence. I'm talking to Maze. My eyes widened. And if I'm talking to Maze, that means Lucifer is also not far behind. Shit. I cannot deal with this crap. Not now. Why the fuck is she even here? This is Young Justice. Not the Arrowverse. Cat got your tongue? No worries. I like the silent type. They always make the most beautiful sound when I cut them up. She stepped up and kicked a small stool towards me. The furniture sailed through the air and separated into two parts from a hasty swipe of my hand. Unfortunately, I lost sight of Maze. I used my new subskill to sense fluctuations in the air and rolled away from the dagger coming down at me from the top. How had she gotten up to the ceiling so fast? The Maze I know is not this strong. Her punch slammed onto my guard and I was thrown back onto the wall of Galiel's office. Cracks appeared on it along with an imprint of my body. I evaded another dagger aimed at my heart by suddenly doing a split. She jumped forward but I performed a windmill that transitioned into a back spin, hitting her with a blast of wind and throwing her away. The blast pushed away the table and made the papers on top of it fly. Maze grunted once she landed, looking surprised and ready to jump into the fight. Wait! This is all a misunderstanding. I'm not with him. I told her with my hands raised up. I didn't want to start a fight I couldn't finish which was especially true for this one. She cocked her head to the side. So you do talk? I chuckled nervously looking out for him. When I have something to say. May stood up from her slightly crouched position and started walking around me. What was that attack? Are you one of these, superhumans? My gaze never left hers and my senses were on high alert. Something like that. What about you? You don't look like you're from here. She smirked. Something like that. There was a brief silence, then she cocked her chin towards Galiel's remains. Why did you kill him? And how can you remain so calm about it? The first kill is always the hardest. For anyone. I started subtly moving towards the small table where the goblet had been placed, while forcing myself to act calm. Luckily, I had already transferred the Metatrigger inside to a whiskey bottle. Her words struck a chord inside me. She was right. I was eerily calm for someone who had just taken another life. No, not calm, composed. My hands were slightly shaking which made me realize that it was composure. I had already made up my mind. This was just a result of my strong conviction. But her words made me curious. How did you know that this is my first time killing someone? 
instead of May's answering, a deep silky smooth voice did. It's a trait exclusive to the best of the Lilums. The ability to sense sins. Before May's, your true self is laid bare. Oh no! I looked towards the source of the voice and marveled in wonder. He was, distractingly handsome. I'm a completely straight guy if my sexuality has ever come into question, but, wow. This guy, makes me feel as if I'm staring at the combination of every woman's wet dream. He was sinfully, badly, and evilly attractive. My heart hammered in fear. I hadn't felt his presence. Even through my senses, particularly the disturbance in the air, I still hadn't sensed him. What? The. Actual. Fact? I backed away warily. I needed to get out of there. I see you took your time. Maze commented while twirling a curved dagger. I had to. It would be remiss of me to not tour my new premises now, wouldn't it? I have even thought of an apt name. He spread out his hands. Every action he did registered as glorious to my mortal mind. What do you think of, Lux? He finished with a flourish. Lux? Mays hummed, a finger on her chin. I like it. Plus the irony is just like you. Yes. It's quite fitting. Lucifer looked around and frowned at the state of the room before zeroing in on Galiel's remains. Mays, why is there a pentagram on the floor? I thought we talked about this. No shenanigans before we settle down. He snapped his finger and it was like time reversed. The disarrayed room, smashed tables and glasses, cracks on the wall, everything was fixed and when he was done, the Lightbringer, first of the fallen, turned his attention back to me. Now what should we do with you, I wonder? Chapter 32 A Deal with the Actual Devil Aiden's P.O.V A thin trail of sweat fell down my back. My whole body was on high alert. I felt a pressure unlike anything else way down on my very core. Our eye contact ended when I was forced to lower my eyes from his own. Interesting. The handsome man said, studying me curiously. My back was to the balcony. I could make a run for it. Maybe even with the metatrigger. It was close to me after all. I could distract them with a full-powered wind blast. Nothing held back maybe. You're not normal, are you? A voice said from my back. My eyes blinked and I realized he was behind me. I know it's exhausting to keep on saying this, but I hadn't felt even the slightest bit of disturbance in the air. My shoulders eased up and the tension left me. There was no need to panic anymore. I understood now. This wasn't an existence I could take on. Maze? I was confident in beating her. Her whole style relied on misdirection and attacking from the shadows. Lucifer? He was immortal and omnipotent in the comics, second only to the presence and his light. Word for word. This wasn't the comics. Instead, it was a mishmash of events from the Kamu, DC animated universe, and now the Arrowverse. To that effect, I couldn't count on anything. I couldn't count on him being a pretty chill guy or not having the crazy power level of his counterpart. I couldn't fight him and find out just how huge the disparity was. Which left talking. The name is Aiden. Who are you? I inquired. Lucifer went to a red posh couch placed along the walls of Galiel's office and sat on it. He closed his legs and leaned back, a glass of wine appearing on his hand, magically. Yeah, not fighting was the right move. I suppose I haven't introduced myself. How rude. I'm the devil, first of the fallen, the deceiver whom you use an excuse to explain away your sinful actions. Tis I the Lucifer Morningstar himself. Gaze into my eyes and be tempted, yada yada yada. He finished with a roll of his eyes. Maze snorted and started chuckling. My eyebrows rose up. Who kk? Lucifer pointed at the laughing woman. That's Maze. She's basically like my caretaker or housekeeper. Fuck you. Maze shot back smoothly. Anyway, now that we have those pesky intros over and done with. I'm curious about something, 
What are you? His eyes shone with a red glow and I found myself compelled to answer. However, my mouth refused to open and my whole body froze up. My thoughts grew muddled and my chest tight. Something was wrong. I heard Maze's voice from far away but couldn't muster the concentration needed to understand her words. I completely blacked out. An undefined time later, I woke up with a start, breathing heavily while trying to calm down my wildly beating heart. My fingers dug into the material of the couch Lucifer had been seating on before as I looked around. Well, that's interesting. Lucifer said. He had pulled up the same seat Galiel had used when I came in and was watching me with a curiosity that sent me on edge. Maze, on the other hand, had a weird expression on her face. She was trying to hide it but I recognized a little bit of fear as she stared at me. What happened? I asked, running a hand over my face. Blacking out like that had never happened to me before. Not since the whole Penguin Mob vs. Batman and Robin thing I had stumbled in the first time. Nothing much. You just blacked out while we were having our conversation. Yeah, I got that. I'm just wondering what caused it. Perhaps you have something to do with that? I asked, pointedly. Lucifer had the ability to find out anyone's deepest desires in the show. It wasn't a stretch to think that he might have used that ability on me. I have no idea what you're talking about. A smug smile made its way onto his lips. Maze, can we get our friend here a glass of water? Maze looked at him in displeasure. No, I'm good. The only thing I wanted to do was to leave. Skedaddle. Disappear and hope I never came across the devil and his, whatever Maze was to him. Oh, then perhaps you prefer something else with a little bit of, kick. Saying that, the whiskey bottle containing the Metatrigger appeared in his hands. I tightened my palms and forced my face to go neutral. I don't know what you mean. Really? You mortals are all the same. I'll say this in case you still don't understand who you're standing, or rather laying before. I'm the bloody devil. You can't cheat death, the truth, and lastly me. His words had a finality that I knew couldn't be refuted. He opened the stopper on top of the glass bottle and took a whiff of the contents inside. His nose scrunched up in distaste. I can feel your desire for this. The question that remains is, do you know what it is? He rolled his eyes when I refused to answer. Of course you do. My jaw clenched at the turn in situation. Galiel was dead, which wasn't a bad thing, but the problem is I couldn't reap the benefits with Lucifer here. God, my luck. I swung my feet back to the floor and sat up straighter on the couch. What do you want? The devilish smile on his face was predatory. A proposal of sorts. See, I've realized something, whatever shit show that Galiel had going on here is, partly my fault. And Galiel is not the only denizen of hell running around in the mortal world. So I need a clean-up guy. And that's where you come in. A dumbfounded look appeared on my face. What? Lucifer clapped his palms together and got up. Good. We're in agreement then? Wait, what? I quickly got up to counter his words, but he beat me to it. And as a gesture of goodwill, you can take the essence and a small portion of whatever you find in the safe. His words ground me to a halt. He had me. To be honest, if I said no to the deal, I would not only lose everything I had come here for and go back with nothing, but I was also risking offending the devil. You know, that guy with power just below the presence? The guy who can destroy me with a mere thought? Yeah. I'm not too keen on that. On the flip side, if I did accept his deal, then it would entail interacting with the devil and his. Seriously, what's Maze's role in all this? Friend some more. Not to mention, being his clean-up guy meant fighting demons and many more supernatural creatures. Either way I see this, there's no right or wrong choice, just the choice I could live with. And for now, that was choice number two, working for him. My desire to bring about change allowed nothing less than a strong conviction to do whatever I can to achieve what I needed. I looked straight into the eyes of sinful beauty personified and made a deal with the devil. Fine. General P.O.D. The boy had just left. 
Mays had seen from his face that he couldn't have been any more than 18 which was the age humans generally reached maturity. To Mays, however, even an 80-year-old man was like a flower yet to bloom. Too young to understand life in its full scope, yet going on about it as if they did. She often wondered how a species so short-lived had even more passion and love for life than her sisters and brothers. Then again, the very nature of their short mortality demanded a semblance of fulfillment. She stopped herself. That train of thought was irrelevant because the boy, Aiden, was not a normal human at all. Not after what they had seen when the boy had blacked out. She could still remember the splendor of glowing white eyes and a presence that was in no way weaker than Lucifer's. Maze had been terrified. And she didn't get terrified. Not really. She has seen everything and anything this world had to offer. The best and worst of humanity, but this, this was something else entirely. Lucifer had at that moment gone still with a serious look on his face. He never broke eye contact with Aiden or whatever the thing possessing him had been. For two minutes none of them talked, but from the way they watched each other, Mays knew they must have been communicating telepathically. What was it? She asked Lucifer, breaking the silence that had permeated the room upon Aiden's departure. Lucifer had gone silent, lost in contemplation when Aiden crossed the door behind him. Mays's nervousness increased at his continued silence. Lucifer. What are you not telling me? The boy, he's more special than we thought. This vacation is turning out to be very interesting. He finally commented. His voice soft and gentle. A quality that had always managed to put her at ease, but today, it only made Mays dread his next words because Lucifer was far from done. His tone took on a harder note. It called itself the Avatar Spirit. No real sentience, just a mass of ethereal energy running on a complex equation to simulate consciousness. A consciousness with only one role, protect the boy and destroy whatever threatens his life. Lucifer went silent. And that's not even the most intriguing part. One, it was able to guard his mind from my mental probe and two, it's not from around here. The Avatar spirit is a being from outside daddy's jurisdiction. And that means... Mays widened her eyes. Demiurgic power has no influence on him because he is not marked as part of God's creation. You and Michael cannot undo his existence. Mays sat down with a look of shock on his face. Lucifer, how? How did that thing spear through the multiversal cluster walls and into our reality? Another glass of wine appeared on Lucifer's hand. He watched the swishing liquid inside the glass and answered, I don't know. Chapter 33 The Disappearance of Dr. Fate Aiden's P.O.V. I got back late. My mind was occupied by the conversation I had just had with the devil and the new developments waiting for me in the horizon. I sighed as I removed my clothes and stepped into the shower. Galiel's office coupled with the disgusting underground fighting ring had left me feeling filthy and unclean. I scrubbed my body until I was satisfied and then stepped out. My eyes ran over the bundle of items I had hidden inside my hoodie and walked over after drying my hair. I settled down on my bed and separated the items into four different piles. First there was jewelry that looked very expensive. Second, a stack of bills that added up to 26k. Then the metatrigger contained in a whiskey bottle and lastly, a client list. The list was of a few high-profile people like politicians that Galiel had bribed, blackmailed, or been in business with. The commissioner of the L.A.P.D. was also on his payroll, which is how he'd gone so long without being found out. For a demon, Galiel kept a well-detailed list of not only his assets but his contacts as well, which is how I came upon the most interesting name on the list for me. There wasn't much information about it and it was filed under, special consultant. That name was Noah Cutler or otherwise known to all DC fans as the calculator. The name sent alarm bells ringing inside my head. Was this the same Batman villain who had a genius intellect and was an informer for supervillains? The fact that Lucifer existed in this world showed that there was more I still didn't know. More wrenches to derail my plans if I half-assed this. Fortunately, the good side to all this was that if the calculator actually did exist, 
then it meant most of my problems about finding some interesting people I had in mind were now non-existent. I could just hire him for that. I filed that away and neatly arranged all the folders into one bundle. I could anonymously give this to the League and watch as they dismantled Galiel's operations and took down all the corrupt officials of the government or I could save this for a rainy day. A sort of leverage for when I wanted things to truly go my way. The only problem with that was, I would compromise my own ideals by letting these people continue to walk free after the things they'd been involved in. Tax evasion, fraud, abduction, torture, our asterisk P.E., murder, let's just say that Galil knew how to keep an interesting group. I chuckled. This would probably be the make or break moment of a hero if this was a comic book. Had I decided to selfishly keep the docket of information, I would have spiraled down into more and more selfish and greedy situations until finally I fell and became a supervillain. Or something like that. Fortunately, the real world is much more complex. One mistake or oversight doesn't spell out the direction your life is going to take. That was a narrow-minded perspective on what life truly is. The capacity for good or bad is equal in all of us. Some are just too jaded and selfish to listen to their inner selves. I packed everything up and placed it into a bag I'd bought when I had gone for clothes shopping with Connor a while back. Then I put the bag under my bed. Speaking of which, I need to find a secure place to stash my things. The stack of bills were also inside that same bag which left only the expensive jewelry and the Metatrigger essence on the table next to my guitar. The jewelry went into a sachet that I kept separate from the funds. I was going to see if I could exchange the jewelry for some cash and then hire someone probably the calculator to open up an untraceable bank account for my activities. The jewelry could be safely exchanged the next time I went to Metropolis. The economy and overall better living standard of the city of tomorrow would ensure less suspicion than Happy Harbor which was so close to Mount Justice. I knew there was probably no chance that Batman would find out about the jewelry but taking extra precautions never hurt anyone. Lastly, I stared at the Metatrigger in the whiskey bottle. Lucifer hadn't looked particularly thrilled to give it to me. It hadn't been obvious and would probably be arrogance to say I understood him but from his tone and the cold eyes, I knew that the essence in my possession was not a popular item to the Lord of Hell. I wonder what would happen if I actually used it. What sort of power would I get? Would it add to my current mastery in the bending styles or have a different effect on my body? Based on the fact that it was essence refined from metahumans then it would mean that I could develop a metagene. I contemplated on using it at that moment. Just opening the stopper and drinking it down. What stopped me was a thought. If Galiel could use it to create metas in the form of Dumb and Dumber and also the one who had built those metagene scanning devices, couldn't I also do the same? But by drinking the metatrigger right now, I would lose that option. It wasn't a secret that I was going to branch out on my own in the future. And instead of recruiting other superheroes to join my cause, what if I created my own? Decision made. I placed the Metatrigger right next to the last vial of Cobra Venom I had kept from the bust at the Santa Prisca factory. I really needed a place I could hide these things. It would be a disappointment if Robin just happened to snoop around and come across the Cobra Venom. All my efforts in building trust with the team would all be for naught. The next morning I woke up early and proceeded to the training room as usual. My brief altercation with Maze and by extension Lucifer had surprisingly shed some light on what I needed to work on. My fighting style was heavily reliant on chi blocking or bending, which was a solid combination both for crowd control, one-on-one -on -one battles and even when I'm outnumbered. In other worlds, I had some good offensive options. Therein lies the problem. It wasn't a matter of being bad at defense but instead not having a way to escape a battle I couldn't win. If Lucifer had been at all serious about harming me, I doubt I could have defeated him let alone flee. That meant before I got to the level I was confident I could take on Dark Seed himself and win, I had to approach every fight as if I was at a disadvantage and have a strategy for escaping in case things went sideways. So I stayed the entire morning, refining my sonic scream to a sufficiently dangerous level. The air rippled and pushed the wave of ocean water away. I was on the beach having decided that practicing sonic scream inside the cave was a bad idea. 
for several reasons, actually not just because I could risk a cave-in if I wasn't careful, but also because Connor's ears were very sensitive. I've always prided myself in being good at empathizing, so here I am, breathing in the cold air and fighting with the ocean. An hour in and I started making it into a game. I tried shaping my sonic blasts narrower for a harder concussive effect and then upping the intensity and spreading out the attack evenly from the point of contact. A shower of ocean water would rise up at that moment and fall down in a spectacle that caused a rainbow once the sun's first rays hit it. It was beautiful. From there I begun trying to emit sonic attacks from the rest of my body, particularly my hands. That didn't work though so I changed tactics and started meditating to get a sense of the vibrations propagating in the air whenever an object passed through it. My auditory awareness spread out fully. I could hear the gentle push and pull of the waves as they hit the beach, birds chirping almost 200 meters away, the slight hum of the sand as sunlight shone on the grains and heated them up and a whooshing sound approaching me. I opened my eyes just as Red Tornado touched down on the ground before me. Good morning, Tornado. Good morning to you too, Maelstrom. His robotic voice was as blunt as ever. I cracked my neck and rose up while stretching. To what do I owe this pleasure? I finally asked, killing the brief silence that had befallen us. I have reviewed your mission accomplishments. Coupled with your strict discipline in training and learning more about being a hero, I believe you can help me. A confused expression appeared on my face. What do you mean? Are you saying you need my help in a mission or something? Precisely. I need you to help me find someone. An old friend of mine. Realization dawned on me. He was talking about Kent, the previous host of Nabu, a Lord of Order. His hero name was Dr. Fate. I remember this event happening in the animation. The mission went from a simple missing person investigation to a fight with Clarion the Witch Boy, a Lord of Chaos. And Red Tornado was personally requesting for my help instead of presenting the mission to the team. Something isn't right here. Okay. I'm listening. His name is Kent. And he's been missing for close to two weeks now. Not to sound rude, Tornado, but why ask me? The League would have a better chance at finding him than I ever could. Red Tornado was silent for a while before saying something that completely shocked me. Kent is mostly known by his other self, the hero Dr. Fate. I approached you because the Helmet of Fate shares almost the same flavor of energy as yours. The origin of your powers seemed to be similar to that of a Lord of Order. Chapter 34, The Helmet of Fate Aiden's P.O.V I was tongue-tied, mouth slightly open in shock. The origin of my powers was similar to the Helmet of Fate. That, that was, surprisingly believable. It made a lot of sense. The Avatar's role was basically keeping balance between the material and spiritual world. Granted, I didn't understand what that meant in the DC world but that purpose was not unlike the Lords of Order. Their purpose was to maintain order and foil Lords of Chaos like Clarion. Another thing was that the Avatar spirit was a high-tier supernatural entity aligned to peace and light which made her a close relation to the Lords of Order, the antithesis of the Lords of Chaos. It was convoluted at its core because I doubt I possessed Rava's spirit inside me. Why was I so sure of this? For starters, I wasn't a super-powerful bending master reincarnated every generation to maintain peace among the four bending nations and secondly, the Avatar system siphoned its energy from the blind eternities. That couldn't be where a Lord of Order like Nabu acquired his powers. I wasn't a fan of the comics but I think, a Lord of Order represents the extreme embodiment of stagnation which to a short-lived being like a human can be misinterpreted as good. A Lord of Chaos is vice versa. The Extreme Agents of Anarchy Where was I going with this point? Their powers had a mystical origin and could be explained away by high-tier magic or something. My own powers seemed like a complex science project in comparison. So the question remains, why did Red Tornado sense that our energies were similar? Could that mean that maybe I possessed an innate talent for the mystic arts apart from the powers I got from the Avatar system? Interesting but unlikely. This wasn't something I could solve now, but maybe if I studied the helmet I could get the answers to my questions. I think we need full hands on deck with this. 
the rest of the team's help will prove invaluable. I informed Red Tornado after thinking about it. The mission details were coming back to me now. Basically, Clarion and Abracadabra, a supervillain who used technology to fake magic had abducted Kent Nelson, the retired Doctor Fate so that he could help them gain access to the Tower of Fate and steal the Helmet of Fate. The team intervenes and they end up fighting off Clarion when Wally puts on the Helmet of Fate and gains access to immense mystical ability. We could take on Clarion as long as we worked together and targeted his pet cat, Tickle, which was his anchor to the real world. It wasn't going to be easy but a part of me was excited. Excited to see how I matched up against someone like Clarion. Negative. This mission does not require assistance from the rest. It is a simple reconnaissance to the Tower of Fate. I have already investigated the premises myself. You'll go there to see if I have missed anything. I frowned. Okay, I get that he doesn't know how badly this shit will go down, but come on. Haven't they learned something from all our past missions? With all due respect, Tornado. I don't think that's a good idea. All of our past missions have had some unforeseen developments. Going in less than prepared is. Are you not confident in carrying out this task? His question drew me up short. No. That's not what I'm saying. If any unforeseen developments do occur withdraw and contact me immediately. That said, your point does have merit. You can take the team with you. With that he left me on the beach feeling weirded out by the whole thing. It wasn't like Red Tornado to do things hastily but I guess I could understand his desperation. He must have been feeling useless that he hadn't found out Kent's whereabouts and was instead stuck pulling surveillance at the watchtower. I could also excuse him because in his opinion, this wasn't a dangerous mission, just an investigation to see if we could find out anything about Kent's disappearance. I finished up with my exercises, making sure I had sufficiently upped my control over the sonic attacks. Something told me I would need them for what we would be facing. After school was out, the rest of the team was gathered at the hall. All except for Robin who was with Batman in Gotham. So Aqualad, you said there was a mission for us? Kid Flash asked while stuffing his face with a burger. Not exactly. It doesn't come from Batman. Red Tornado has asked us to check up on the disappearance of an old friend of his from when he was part of the Justice Society. Sweet! Maybe I can get another souvenir. Those guys had some awesome adventures back then. Wally said, Ugh! Is that all you care about? Artemis questioned while giving the fastest boy in the world the stink eye. Nope. I can give you a list if you're so interested about my likes though, Artemis. Wally shot back smoothly, making the rest of us laugh. Focus. Maelstrom will do the briefing. Aqualad ordered and everyone settled down. I stepped forward and swiped my hand at the projector near the wall. An image of an eighty or so year old man appeared on the screen. This is Kent Nelson, otherwise known as Dr. Fate and he's been missing for more than two weeks. The briefing went smoothly. I answered all their questions, even the dumb and idiotic ones from Wally. Artemis was close to exploding in anger when Wally pretended he believed in magic to impress Gan. I was kinda annoyed but I knew that soon he would change his whole outlook on magic. I tucked the key to the Tower of Fate that Red Tornado had given me earlier in the day and we left for Salem, where the tower was located. So Wally, when did you realize your honest affinity for sorcery? I sighed. Here we go again. Wally cleared his throat and responded to Artemis' question with a lie that almost made me roll my eyes. Well I huh, before I became Kid Flash, I seriously thought about becoming a wizard. I tuned them out just as we arrived at the coordinates given to us by Red Tornado. The bio ship opened up and we all jumped out. After deeming that this wasn't a real mission, the team had opted to go in our civilian attire. I didn't argue against that because I knew the fight would take place inside the Tower of Fate. That meant the chances for a civilian spotting us in our real-life identities was close to nil. That said, I palmed the balaclava inside my pocket comfortingly. I wasn't exactly comfortable with taking that risk. Robin had the right idea to always carry a domino mask for when heroics were needed. 
everyone spread out and look around. Aqualad gave the order and everyone fanned out. I didn't jump to use the key because I wanted to leave a bigger impression on Wally when the tower appeared before his eyes despite not existing a few moments prior. We didn't find anything and regrouped. There's nothing here. Could Tornado have given us the wrong coordinates? Connor asked. Unlikely. I shook my head. So what do you think it is, adaptive micro-optical electronics and phase shifting? Artemis asked our resident speedster who was also the expert in technology and engineering barring Robin. Wally spared a look at Mgan and quickly changed what he was about to say. Huh, it's clearly mystical. I couldn't take it anymore. Really? You'll have to try better than that to convince me you believe in the mystic arts man. Wally immediately blushed which caused Artemis to break out in laughter. That aside, I begun, showing them the key I had. I have an idea. Red Tornado wouldn't give us a key if he wasn't sure we would find the tower. I stepped forward and felt a brief hum from the key. My hand reached out and a keyhole manifested before me in the open air. I stabbed the key inside and turned it. With a shimmer, a building appeared before us. Everyone gasped at the sight. I can't believe this was here the whole time. Connor said, odd just like the rest of the group. I pushed the door open and from inside a torrential aura of power registered in my senses as a static feeling creeping up my skin. This place. I started. I know. The Conservatory of Magic in Atlantis feels the same way. Raw untamed magical power. Aqualad finished in a respectful tone. We proceeded inside and found ourselves in a bare room. The door behind us instantly disappeared as soon as the last person entered. Okay. This is getting kinda creepy. Artemis commented. No need to be afraid, Artemis. Back in Mars, the sorcerers were often masters of intrigue and strangeness. Maybe it's similar on Earth, too. Gan commented in that positive optimism that I found so endearing. I regret that the longer she stays on Earth the more she's going to realize just how much the world actually sucks. Greetings. You have entered with a key, but the tower dies not recognize you. Please state your purpose and intent. A projection of Kent Nelson appeared before us and declared. Before any of us could stop him, Wally stepped forward. We are true believers, here to find Dr. Fate. Damn it! I cursed out loud, shocking everyone present. How had I forgotten about Wally and his big mouth? The projection disappeared and disaster followed. The floor below us gave out and we plummeted towards a lava pit. Wally, I will kill you. Chapter 35 the Formidable Air Bender Part 1 General P.O.V. Aiden and the others had just entered the Tower of Fate when behind them three individuals appeared. One of them, a lanky boy dressed in a black tuxedo with a red-eyed cat on his shoulder, stared at Aiden's back curiously. Interesting. He intoned. The cat on his shoulders purred softly and he rubbed it affectionately. You're right, Tickle, this is turning more and more into a party. Hurry up, Aubrey, let's get this show on the road. Clarion instructed a tall man dressed in a white shirt standing next to him. Abracadabra was holding a wand on his left hand, while the right one roughly pushed an older gentleman forward. Move. The older man grumbled but still complied, walking forwards to stop before the entrance to the tower. An omega symbol flashed yellow on the door and then the door flew open. The two men... Boy and Cat proceeded onwards into the empty room. I should get a tower someday. I really love the decor. Clarion declared with a wide smile on his face. It would suit you perfectly. Abracadabra offered only for the cat on Clarion's shoulders to swipe its paws at him. Settle down, Tikal. And Abra, I was being sarcastic. Look at this place. Who would want to live in a place saturated by so much disgusting order mystic energy? Personally, I think a little anarchy is needed. I'll make sure to destroy this thing once we get the helmet. You will do no such thing. I won't let. Kent Nelson was suddenly silenced by a collar device that attached to his neck, cutting off his words. 
That should shut you up. Abracadabra said smugly before pushing the old man forward again. The wall in front of them shifted into columns that withdrew to the sides, revealing an office on the other side. They walked through and the columns closed behind them. A projection of the tower in the form of Kent Nelson appeared before them. Kent, I don't believe I have ever seen you accommodate guests before. Unfortunately, Kent wasn't the one who responded to the tower's subtle question. The collar on the old man's neck flashed red and Kent's pre-recorded message played. My friends come to help me. Kent clenched his jaw in anger and frustration at his helplessness. He held out hope, however, that he would be rescued. He only needed a chance to put on the helmet and with fate's power, driving off Clarion would be an easy task. The tower's projection faded and the door in front of them opened up to reveal a row of staircases going in every direction. Clarion buzzed with excitement. Oh, I can almost feel it. World domination at my fingertips. A sudden blast of air impacted Abracadabra and ragdolled him to smash onto the steps of a staircase just above their heads. The fake magician's mouth widened in pain as he instantly passed out and begun to fall. An air tornado gently lowered him to the ground while his wand clattered next to him. Blood was dripping from a cut on the back of his head. Kent's eyes widened in shock. That attack had been so unexpected. Who could it be? Red Tornado? Martian Manhunter? Beside him, even Clarion was surprised. Usually the heroes were not that brutal. Tickle's fur rose up as it stared in a certain direction towards a staircase just below them. Someone was there. Clarion's senses warned him of the order-like nature of this person's power and he took a step back. There's something to be said about counting your chicks before they hatch. Don't. A smooth voice addressed them all. The owner of the voice jumped from the staircase below them and landed right where they were. He aimed a finger right at them and released a small wind bullet that hit the collar on Kent's neck. The device sparked and fell off him. Thank you. Kent rubbed his neck while still leering in shock and awe. A kid had taken down Abracadabra with a single blow. What are they feeding children these days? You? Clarion shouted and threw his hands forward. Red lightning bolts shot forward towards the kid. Kent's eyes widened. He was too late to stop it. New. Before his very eyes, however, something shocking happened. The kid waved his hand. A hand that Kent noticed held his walking stick and a yellow barrier manifested between him and the Lord of Chaos attacks. Clarion's chaos bolts washed over the barrier and ran along its whole form. Despite the lethality of the power, the boy didn't seem to feel the strain. He spread out his hands and the shield bubble enlarged in magnitudes. Clarion brought both of his hands together and poured more of his power into the beams he was throwing. The red and black energy manifested into spikes of rotating weapon constructs and slammed onto the boy's clearly mystical barrier. The spikes bounced off the shield and speared into the surroundings. No! How can this be? What are you? What are you? Clarion screamed out in panic. Ken had never thought he could share anything with the Lord of Chaos, but he was also wondering the same thing. What was going on? This wasn't how a fight between an untrained and a Lord of Chaos should go. The yellow light pushed everything away and Clarion quickly covered himself and Tickle in a red shield. Kent was unharmed by the light and when it died down, he found his cane hovering before him. There was a soft breeze that blew the dust from Clarion's deflected attacks revealing the boy who had matched up against the Lord of Chaos, calmly floating in the air. He pointed his finger at Clarion who was seething in anger. I'm not really a magic wielder and I still clapped your ass. So to make it fair, I'm coming at you with my own powers. Let's do this. He said flying forward towards Clarion. I'll destroy you brat. Clarion shouted and started brimming with his full power. Kent thought about intervening but a slight shake of the boy's head towards him told him that his attention was needed elsewhere. The boy would occupy Clarion's attention for now and Kent could use that time to get to the helmet. One last run as Dr. Fate was welcome especially in the current situation. Aiden's P.O.D. A while ago. The air surrounding us jumped at my slightest beaconing and held everyone afloat. 
Oh, thank God one of us has an ability well suited for this. Death by sizzling hot lava wasn't on my agenda for today. Wally quipped, staring at the red glowing liquid below us. This is all your fault. Your impress Megan at all cost shenanigans almost cost us our lives. You don't even believe in magic. Artemis finally blew up at him. What? Wally looked surprised at being caught red-handed. Wally, you don't believe? Gan asked him in a little surprise. Fine. Magic is a sham. Everything can be explained by science because the idea of a miraculous potent force with its own impractical whims and applications is preposterous. Early man used to think that fire is magic. Fire! Sorry, but I choose to have some common sense. Wally finished his rant. Meanwhile, I had been thinking of a way to get out of the situation we found ourselves in. We couldn't go out because the floor had closed above us. I didn't know if we could use brute force to smash our way through, but I highly doubted it. The tower was brimming with power, after all. How had they escaped in cannon? Gah! I feel like I'm missing something. I watched the show back on my world, but despite my memories getting clearer due to the mental exercises I had been doing, it couldn't replace anything I hadn't memorized. I hadn't paid that much attention to the show, so my knowledge was not perfect. Guys, this is not the time. It doesn't look like it, but you people are heavy. Artemis, who was next to me, punched me on the arm. I looked at her with my eyebrows raised. She had the grace to look sheepish. Sorry, force of habit. You don't comment on a lady's weight or age. Lady? You? I've heard you curse like a sailor. Kid Flash countered. Oh, bite me, you piece of. Artemis. Gan uncharacteristically shouted, cutting off the archer's next unsavory words. They actually made Gan raise her voice in something else other than giddy excitement. I would have laughed if I didn't know it wasn't the time for it. Okay. I'm going to drop you too if you don't play nice. I warned them and released them from my hold a little. Wally started waving his hands in fear. I'll play nice. I'll play nice. Yeah, what he said. Just don't drop us. Artemis added. Good. Now does anyone have an idea? Calder, you and Gan are the ones with the most experience when it comes to magic. Calder, who was slightly sweating, shook his head. No. Atlantean magic is different enough from what you have here that I can't think of a way. Shit. What if we try to break the floor above us, just get me up there and I'll get it done. Connor offered banging his fist on his palm. Not going to work. The whole structure of the tower is saturated with magic power. It's not going to go down that easy especially given the fact that Kryptonians are susceptible to magic just like normal humans. I told him, quickly killing that idea. Hello, Megan. We never really answered the question. Gan suddenly said. My eyes lit up. Holy crap. You're right. That's how they did it. Gan looked around at the walls of the tower. Red Tornado sent us to make sure that Mr. Nelson and the Helmet of Fate were safe. Upon her words, a brick floor appeared below us, covering the lava pit. Instantly, the temperature almost cooking us alive disappeared. I breathed out a sigh of relief and controlled the wind to gently land us on the now stable and cool floor. Phew! That was close. For a minute there I thought we were done for. Thanks for saving us, beautiful. Wally blitzed over to Mgan and tried to place his hand on her shoulder. No. Artemis came in between them and shoved Wally off. What? I was just saying thanks. You don't get to act so cavalier when we almost got deep fried because of you. Wally sighed loudly. Fine. I'm sorry about that. Artemis nodded. And. I still think magic is a lie. God damn it, Wally. Artemis threw her hands up. Calder and I started inspecting the area for a way to leave as Wally and Artemis kept on arguing. After the whole ordeal, I remembered something. There was a latch on the floor somewhere around, there. My hand grasped the metal and pulled. Instead of the backdraft from the lava that would roast us alive, 
a cold breeze permeated the whole room after revealing the hole on the floor. I looked over towards Wally. Still don't believe in magic wall man? Chapter 36 The Formidable Air Bender Part 2 Aiden's P.O.V. I was the first one across the hole. Midway through the jump, space aligned weirdly and I landed on my feet upright. I moved to the side and watched the others emerge one after the other. I connected with the air in the space we found ourselves in and tried to get a sense of it. I frowned. Something was actively messing with my ability because everything overlapped. I could feel exactly one centimeter away from me but everything further than that was just a haze of unrecognizable feedback. Okay. This I wasn't expecting. Wally commented. You ready to admit that it's magic? Artemis asked. In response Wally crossed his hands on his chest. In your dreams. Besides I have a perfect explanation for this. Really? Gan perked up. Okay this I've got to hear. I said under my breath. Ever heard of string theory? What we're looking at is a stable pocket dimension. He lectured spreading his hands out. Huh. Actually that's not too out of left field. But he was still wrong. The whole frozen space was chock full of mystic energy. Maybe it was a pocket dimension but one constructed through magic. Guys, leaving aside Wally's insistence that magic does not exist, we have a mission to carry out so let's move. We started walking for a few minutes. Despite it being cold enough to freeze the shit out of anyone, none of us was really shivering that much. An effect of the tower no doubt. Especially after we had told it our true intentions. The hostility from before had changed into something more or less amicable. The ice below us scrunched under my boots as we kept on walking. Hey guys what's that? Wally pointed towards a yellow glinting object. My eyes widened. That was Kent's magical cane. We increased our speed and surrounded the walking stick. It's a bit early for a souvenir but don't mind if I do. Wally said and reached out his hands to grab it. Yeah, no. I controlled the wind to push the magical cane above him and made it flow towards me. Dude what the hell? Wally stormed towards me looking annoyed. I saw it first. I raised my eyebrows at his aggrieved words and almost barked out a laugh. Wally your recklessness caused us trouble today. We almost died because of your skepticism towards the mystic arts. For this mission I think you should watch yourself. We can't afford another close shave like before. My words had the effect I wanted. He stopped and looked guilty. Yeah, I guess you're right. So what do you guys think this is? Connor wondered out loud. The magical energy pouring out of this thing is phenomenal. I believe it is a foci just as the inscriptions on my skin help me to channel magic for my electric blasts and water manipulation. Calder informed us. Maybe it belongs to Mr. Nelson? It's a walking stick and not to sound rude but the guy is over 90. It makes a lot of sense. Artemis added. Yeah let's take it with us, when we find him we'll give it back. And when we don't, I get to keep it as a souvenir, you know up until he needs it. Wally suggested which made Artemis punch him on the arm. I chuckled a bit and allowed the magical cane to fall into my hands. I should not have done that. Instantly, upon contact with my skin, light started pouring out of me in waves. I felt something latch onto me and floated upwards. Aiden! Gannis' voice cut through the bubble of light as they tried to reach me. With a sudden pop, I disappeared from the frozen space to an area with bright yellow light. In the middle of the space, a huge face appeared. My face. The eyes were glowing white and my expression was neutral. Where the fuck am I? The avatar state opened its mouth wide and I found myself getting pulled in. I could do nothing as I was sucked into a black hole at the center. My body landed on a hard floor and I caught myself quickly looking around with a million questions running around my head. Kent's walking stick was still firmly in my grip as I stared at the new space I'd found myself in. There were crisscrossing staircases moving up and down and in every other direction in a confusing maze. Oh! Now I remember. 
Wally was also teleported here in canon after he grabbed the cane. But because this time I was the one who had come into contact with it, the magical cane had teleported me instead. Which meant, in a few seconds, Clarion and Abracadabra would arrive with a bound-up Kent Nelson. Excitement and a little bit of fear coursed through me. The smart thing to do would be to wait for the others and fight to free Kent as a whole. But I needed this. I needed to see how far I could be pushed and someone as powerful as Clarion could do that. Plus, I looked at the walking stick in my hand. Calder had said this was a magical foci. Like a wand. And I had felt it latch onto the same energy I used for my bending. Maybe I wasn't as outmatched before Clarion as I thought. I stared at the cane intently. The grooves carved onto its entirety and the way it seemed to pulse with a tsunami of energy. My awareness dug inside it and I widened my eyes in shock. The core of the cane was humming as it tried to contain the energy waves coming from me and straining. I couldn't use the stick that much because in the end something told me it would shatter apart. It was also turning the processed energy and changing its alignment into order, the same as the powers the Helmet of Fate gave to Kent Nelson. The door opened and in walked my opponents. I gulped and firmed my resolve. It's now or never. I didn't waste time and instantly attacked Abracadabra. The blast of wind knocked him out without a chance for retaliation and I took a second to enjoy the shocked looks on Clarion's and Kent's faces. Then the fight begun. I tapped into the foci and used the processed energy to form constructs that could withstand the Lord of Chaos attacks. Although I was winning the altercation, my body was starting to burn up in pain and that was because I wasn't using my powers the way I was supposed to. I had no training in using a magic foci and I was paying for my brashness. It got too unbearable, so I let loose most of the processed energy in a wave of order magic and released the cane. Instantly, the magical artifact flew over to hover before Kent Nelson by some unseen force. I nodded at Kent and he left for the helmet, understanding that I could handle or at least occupy Clarion long enough for Dr. Fate to make a timely appearance. Meanwhile my flight threw me towards Clarion with my hand pulled back in a punch. Clarion's face changed into a rictus grin, eyes burning with fury as a red shield appeared between us. I yelled out in exertion while putting my full strength behind the blow as well as the leftover energy from my contact with Kent's mystical cane. Cracks appeared on the shield and with a shattering sound, I broke through and landed the punch on Clarion's face. His body was lifted up and thrown away to smash onto the sides of a staircase. The feeling of glee at landing such a satisfying blow quickly disappeared when his body broke apart into dozens of bats that flew away to coalesce into the Lord of Chaos emo form on another staircase. Damn you! Damn you! Clarion shouted as he threw his hands forward in a barrage of red chaos energy attacks. I flew away from staircase to staircase trying my best to avoid a direct hit. The attacks sent showers stones and dust flying away to pelt the surroundings. I jumped from a staircase that was blown apart and grabbed hold of the pieces of stones through aerokinesis. A wave of my hand and they flew forward to collide with Clarion's shield. The projectiles did nothing except for making him even angrier. Normally I would taunt my opponent but I was well aware who I was facing. He swiped his hands through the air and slashes of the same red energy manifested and sped towards me. A slightly glowing yellow tornado appeared in front of the attacks and sucked them in and then threw them to the sides. They destroyed a few more staircases revealing more of the maze-like structure. I idly wondered how this space could fare against a full-out serious assault from the Lord of Chaos and shuddered. For all of his faults Clarion had some serious firepower backing him up. I upped my speed and used the brief cover of the tornado to pull in close to him. He might be a powerful caster, but the universal rule about casters is that they are relatively weak at close range. His eyes widened when I suddenly appeared in front of him. A drill slammed onto the shield and broke it again for the second time. I followed it up with an axe kick to Clarion's head, sending him down to faceplant on the floor. His body broke once more into bats, but I was ready for that. A whirlwind appeared around me and pulled all the bats back to the middle of the vortex. I opened my mouth and aimed at the creatures trying to escape. Fuss Roda. The air rippled and screeched as it broke apart in a concussive wave of destruction. 
The whirlwind was instantly destabilized as the sonic attack landed on the bats and destroyed them. The bats screeched and dissolved into an inky and shadowy substance that disappeared. Cracks appeared on the floor below me as I looked on, shocked when the whole platform broke apart into pieces, taking with it the staircase leading down. That attack had been an uncontrolled blast of sonic power. Something that I had never tried before because of just how dangerous it was to my opponent and also to me. I coughed out and blood appeared on the sleeve of my hoodie. My throat felt raw and in pain. I flew down towards another staircase and took a slow breath while massaging my throat. Okay, I don't know if I'll be able to speak for a moan. That thought was cut off when everything suddenly got darker. Shadows and an oily substance flowed up the stairs leading to the platform I was standing on and combined into Clarion. He stared at me coldly. The immature childishness surrounding him from before was now nowhere to be seen. That's it. I'm not having fun anymore. Die! Clarion waved his hands and chaos energy exploded out of his body in an all-encompassing wave. I flew back to avoid most of the quickly approaching spreading of power. The staircases nearest to him were instantly destroyed and the wave quickly reached me. Chapter 37 The Formidable Air Bender Final Part Aiden's P.O.V. Sometimes an obvious thing hits you and you're left wondering how you never saw it before. You're left wondering if you were blind or just dumb that you missed it. Where am I going with this? That same thing happened to me. I had never gone all out before. Not really. In every mission or altercation, my strength had had to be kept in check so as to not hurt someone else. The only fight that had even brought me close to that had been against Solomon Grundy and I had had to put him down quickly so as to not risk civilian lives. The fight with Mr. Twister, I had been unsure, not really familiar with my powers. But against Clarion? There wasn't a problem with hitting him too hard. He could take it. He was immortal after all. The Lord of Chaos unleashed a wave of power that disintegrated everything it touched while heading towards me. I flew backwards while thinking of a plan. In front of me I could see the walls of the tower and knew that there was no escaping the reddish-black energy wave. So I decided not to. Let's do this. I increased my flight speed leaving a sonic boom behind me. Right before I smashed into the wall, I shifted my body so that my feet were pointed towards it and let loose a point-blank wind blast on the wall through my legs. Cracks impossibly appeared on the magical wall as my legs bent. My eyes made contact with Clarion's body and the energy wave bearing down on me. Wisps of all the leftover Yellow Order energy from my contact with Kent's mystical cane appeared around my form. Then I pushed. My body shot off from the wall, leaving behind a crater and flying pieces of brick. A compressed trill made up of the most violent winds I had ever created before formed around my body as I twisted in the air, the order energy covering its form and turning it into a yellow tornado. My flight speed was on a whole other level. I hadn't just surpassed the speed of sound, I had totally fucked it over. There was barely a resistance as my drill speared through Clarion's own attack and all too soon arrived before him. His eyes widened in fear. Who are? My hand speared through his chest and came out the other side. The flight speed I was under carried him towards the wall of the tower and slammed him on it. Clarion coughed out a black liquid and struggled to lift his head up at me. His eyes were red with rage and fear. I will. He started but I slammed a fist onto his face, breaking his nose with my left hand. Clarion groaned and tried to prime his energy and failed. The right hand was still inside his chest, having delivered a blow filled with order energy. The energy was like poison to him, simultaneously ensuring he couldn't do anything while also hurting him. Just to be sure, my left hand shot out and immobilized him further through chi blocking. I heard an angry roar on the platform Clarion had been standing on before and turned my face towards Clarion's familiar. My eyes were cold as I made contact with the oversized cat. Shut the fuck up. Try anything and I'll make him suffer the most unimaginable pain possible. I punctuated my statement by twisting my hand inside Clarion's chest. Clarion groaned in pain. Got it? The cat bristled but stood down. I pulled up closer to Clarion's ear. 
If this was going to work, I needed to show him I was completely different from other heroes. Let me guess. You want to torture me, kill me, devour my soul and all that jazz, right? I asked him softly, a small smile on my face with my eyes halfway closed, looking nonchalant about the whole situation. I don't blame you. You've probably never been in this position before Clary. Content to play your little games with the Lords of Order for centuries on end. Normally a little chaos is like spice. You know, it takes away the boring factor from life. And you don't know this but I hate boring shit. It's just, like no for me. You know what I mean? I twisted my hand inside him like before and his face twisted even more in pain. But then you had to go and ally yourself with that misguided selfish group of fools, giving them the courage and confidence to start pulling shit. My hobbies are playing video games, making music and talking to sexy girls, but I can't. Why? Because of you and the light. Stupid name, by the way. If you're the light, why the fuck do you hide in the shadows? So here's the deal. At that point, the smile dropped and my face went blank with no emotion. Clary engulfed in terror at the lifeless look I had on. Get out while you can, Clary. Cause I'll tell you a little secret. I brought my face closer to his ears. I am planning your deaths. Clarion's breath hitched. No. No. You're a hero. One of the goody, goody two shoes. Heroes, heroes don't kill. I chuckled. Now what gave you the impression that I was good? Does a superhero have to be good to save people from danger? It's all really subjective, you see. Is Batman a hero to his rogues gallery? No, is Dr. Fate, your hero? Definitely not. In fact, the way I see it, they suck at it. You know what a good hero does, Clarion? He shook his head. He ensures that anyone with the guts to murder people en masse is six feet under. I'd rather be the villain if it stops the Joker from causing mass murder. But that's besides the point. A menacing smile appeared on my face while my eyes widened. This is a warning, Clary boy. The next time I see you, I'll end you and don't think I don't know about how you manifest here. I pointed a finger at Tikal. Bam. A wind bullet escaped my finger and dug a hole through Tikal's eyeball. The tiger familiar fell down, dead. New Tikal. A drill appeared around my palm and eviscerated Clarion. His head hung down his chest and his body lost its pulse. Despite that I knew he was far from dead. Clarion was immortal. All I had done was deal him a heavy blow. Mostly due to the leftover order energy I had smartly utilized. His body turned into an oily shadow and disappeared along with his familiar. I looked around at us. At the destruction caused. Abracadabra was still passed out on the same platform Clarion had stood on, saved by the Lord of Chaos probably. Huh, so villains don't mind helping each other out when it's little trouble to them. I flew over to another platform and took some deep breaths while looking at my blood-soaked hands. What, what had I done? What needed to be done? My conviction answered. I didn't fear Clarion's revenge because I knew his type better than most. They would whine and only go into a fight that they knew they would win. Clarion had just lost spectacularly and I knew I had put in the fear of God in him. He wouldn't dare come for me directly because he was afraid of the order power he thought I had access to. This effectively removed the Lord of Chaos from the running for a while. That said, I wouldn't be surprised if he tried to take revenge on me indirectly. However, as long as it wasn't a direct confrontation, anything he could throw at me would be manageable. I tightened my fist. This was the road I had chosen. There wasn't any backing out now. The team was going to no doubt arrive soon though and I couldn't let them see me like this. I opened my mouth and released a small sonic attack that vibrated the blood out of my hoodie and body. General P.O.V. The Watchtower 22 hours after the Tower of Fate mission. This is the Yellowstone National Park, as all of you are quite aware. It's also the base of T.O. Moro, the scientist behind Red Tornado's creation. I have intel that he's planning something. 
something that might prove catastrophic if he's not stopped. Batman swiped his hand and the image of the National Park changed to an image of a middle-aged man with a mustache. Most of the leaguers, with the exception of Green Lantern, Superman who had a toymaker situation to deal with in Metropolis and Green Arrow and Black Canary who were following up a lead on some League of Shadows deal, were present. What exactly is he planning? Shazam asked. Apart from world domination, revenge at us and probably the JSA, Justice Society of America, and a million other selfish reasons that supervillains get a kick out of? The Flash listed off. Yeah, I get that, but I meant what is the plan? How is he going to do that? I am not sure. Which is why the League will be on standby while the junior team does recon. Batman said. So I'm guessing that means, you managed to recover data from the remains of the Mr. Twister android that attacked the team? Captain Adam inquired. Normally the man was usually silent, but when he spoke, his voice was commanding, perfectly suitable for the former as soldier. Batman was silent for a while before offering a curt nod. Affirmative. Although it was difficult to decipher the data, I was able to recover the location of the android's maker. Is it really necessary to send the kids there? The Flash asked. I could go in and be out in minutes, saving us time. Normally you'd be right, but the situation is manageable for now. The team has proved more than capable of handling these types of reconnaissance missions. They need even more experience, and that is something that will happen only in the field. Everyone nodded. As informative as that was Batman, I don't think that's the reason you called us here today. Zatara spoke up. Every turn to Batman, curious. It's not. Have any of you ever had an intergang? After the meeting, Martian Manhunter stayed behind and approached Batman, who was busy typing something on the huge watchtower computer. Why did you lie? He asked the Dark Knight who paused in his action and turned back to face the resident telepath. It was necessary. I am still wary to inform the others about Maelstrom's men knowledge. Yet you finally decided to use it. I know for a fact that the android was too damaged to recover anything. That information about T.O. Moro is from Aiden's docket of information. Batman narrowed his eyes. You think I did a mistake? Martian Manhunter nodded. I do. You should have at least insulted me about going on ahead with this, my friend. Batman was silent before giving Manhunter a brief nod. You're right. I simply did not see the need because the T.O. Moro mission is a simple recon task. I have not confirmed any sightings as of yet. The whole thing hinges on whether the team finds anything there or not. I am sure Red Tornado was briefed beforehand. Yes. He was the first person I talked to. Batman turned to the computer and began using it once more. Manhunter pulled up close next to him. So we're finally using it. Aiden's information. Batman's fingers never stopped. Yes. We can't wait anymore for you to verify whether he's telling the truth through accessing his core memories. We have to use every advantage we can get while we can. Chapter 38, The Mission Ends General P.O.V Guys, look! Artemis pointed towards a glowing door that was just a few hundred meters away from them. The team had been searching for Aiden after his sudden disappearance, but no matter how much they looked, no tracks could be found. After ten minutes of this, Calder had instructed them to get moving so as to find a way out of the frozen wasteland. Kid Flash blitzed fast across the ice and snow, then up the stairs and plunged in without so much as a warning to the rest. Completely forgetting he was under instruction to stand back due to his previous mishap. Wally! Calder shouted a little too late. Why am I not surprised? Let's catch up before the idiot gets himself killed. Artemis told the others and they sped up the stairs. The first thing that Artemis saw was Wally's back. Kid was standing on a platform while looking around in surprise. A second later, Artemis understood why. What the hell happened here? The platform they were standing on was barely holding on. Everywhere she looked was a dust-filled environment with broken and smashed staircases. There was a massive crater on the wall to their right and a hole in the middle space of the tower with destroyed stairs at the edges. 
Luckily, they were near the wall otherwise they would have died as soon as they walked through, falling from such a high distance. What in God's name happened here? Connor's voice brought Artemis' attention to the others who had arrived. The door behind them flashed and disappeared into the wall. Suddenly the platform they were all standing on became crowded and started creaking dangerously. Guys, something tells me we don't want to be here in the next couple of seconds or else we'll end up as pancakes. Wally said referencing to the platform that was swaying under them. Look! We can make it there. Gan said, pointing towards the other end of the room. Wait, is that, something's coming. Connor shouted at them and they quickly raised their guard. Oh, stand down, it's... Aiden? Artemis asked out loud. Right at that minute, the platform under them gave way and Wally let out an unflattering scream as they fell only for the wind to gently hold all the non-flying members of the team aloft. Huh, I had something stuck in my throat. Wally lamely stated at Artemis' stare. That's a load of bullshit and you know it. Artemis quipped with an upturn of her lips. Does Robin know Wally screams like a girl? Aiden asked when he was close enough, making the others laugh. Dude, don't you dare. While they all laughed, Connor narrowed his eyes at Aiden's direction. A scent of rotten blood clung to his body and the hood was tattered in some places. Connor looked into Aiden's eyes and saw none of the humor he tried to project. Something was different about him. Aiden saw his look and they stared at each other for a while. As if the displaced teen was challenging Connor to call him out in front of everybody and look like a fool for making a big issue out of nothing. Connor looked away. This wasn't the time or place. Aiden, it is good to see you're all right. Could you take to us to a more stable ground? Calder spoke up, reminding the teen team that they still weren't out of danger. Cool. I know just the place. The draft carrying them picked up and they cut through the air towards the direction Aiden had just come from. Hey, you all right? Gan asked Connor. You're acting a bit off. Connor debated telling her of his observations, but then decided not to. Although they had gotten closer in the course of his time with the team, Connor didn't trust her enough with something that might have been just baseless suspicions. Connor nodded his head at her and decided to cut off his train of thought and focus on where they were going. Holy shit. Is that Abracadabra? Dude, you captured Abracadabra all by yourself? Even Flash has problems with him from time to time. Wally couldn't believe it. In fact, all of them couldn't believe it because it was like Wally said, Abracadabra was not a two-bit supervillain. He was one of the more competent villains in the Flash's rogue gallery. Connor's eyes snapped to Aiden again in question. The clone knew that Aiden was probably the third strongest member of the team. Behind Gan and himself, of course, but he too would have had trouble fighting Abracadabra due to the mobility issue that plagued Connor. Superboy was the heavy hitter of the team, but what most of the others had him beat at was agility. He wouldn't have evaded Abracadabra's attacks as easily as the others. So based on the fact that Aiden had managed to beat him all by himself, he would have evaluated his closest friend. Aiden threw them an easy smile. I caught him off guard. In a straight fight, it wouldn't have been as easy taking him down. But not hard. Connor thought. What happened here, Aiden? This was a simple search mission, but from the way things are, it looks anything but. Calder questioned. Aiden sighed heavily. A lord of. Chaos had intruded. A new, older voice stated. Before their eyes, a superhero dressed in a black and yellow costume flew out of a yellow glowing ink in the air. Everyone instantly went on guard. Connor placed himself before Mgan to shield her slightly. An action that wasn't missed by her and despite the situation, she blushed a little. Calm down everybody. He's not an enemy. This is Dr. Fate. So Kent is alive? Artemis questioned lowering her bow slightly. That's what I was trying to tell you. The old man is all right. A bit banged up, but he'll live. Indeed. Kent Nelson is alive and well. He appreciates the concern. Saying that Dr. Fate swept his hands out at the wrecked sections of the room and a bright yellow light washed through the surroundings. 
Everyone shut their eyes, and when they opened them, it was like time had reversed. The staircases were whole again, and all the craters on the wall were fixed. Okay, that's cool. Wally admitted in fascination. Does that mean you believe in magic now? Against her better judgment, Artemis asked. Wally surprised them, however, when he didn't outright refuse. You know, with everything that has happened. I'm, let's say 0.0006% there. Calder went forward and patted his shoulder while smiling. It's a start. Thank you again for your assistance, children. Send my regards to Tornado. Saying that, Dr. Fate spread out his hands and a magic circle appeared on the ground before them. With a flash, Connor and the others disappeared. Connor opened his eyes and found himself right where the Tower of Fate had revealed itself. However, now there was nothing but an empty space. He looked at the others and frowned. Abracadabra was lying on the ground still passed out, having been teleported with the team as well, but they were missing one person. Guys, where's Aiden? Gan wondered. Aiden's P.O.V. The Lord of Order and I stared off for a few seconds. I had noticed that although the magic circle had spread out evenly to account for all of us, the space under me was left blank. Nabu most likely wanted to talk to me. The tower registers that Clarion disappeared after facing defeat. I believe that was your doing? Standing close to the guy showed me just how outmatched I was. Dr. Fate was brimming with energy despite the prodigious control he had under his belt. My body seemed to have adapted to sensing out energy and he was almost blinding to my magic sense. I shut off that ability and decided to stay cautious. Beating Clarion had been due to the unique advantage I had had over him at that moment. But now, at my current level of power, I stood no chance against fate. Yes. I use Kent's mystical cane as a foci to shift the energy that powers my abilities into order magical energy. After a brief scuffle, Clarion decided to leave, citing that he had wasted too much time and that you were probably on your way. I looked down while shaking. That's, that's probably the only reason I'm even still alive, sir. He seemed, scared of you. Dr. Fate stared at me for a few seconds while I tried my best to project the image of a teen who had been weighing over his head but had luckily come out relatively unharmed. I see. What's your name? I looked up a bit surprised. Aiden Strong, sir. Fate hummed and flew down towards me. You possess exceptional talent for the mystic arts. Tell me, Aiden Strong, do you want to learn magic? Okay. Now I was actually shocked. And I didn't try to hide it. Not to sound rude, but why me? Despite my talent, I don't think it's that easy for you to offer just anyone something like this. Fate went silent while staring off into space. I cocked my head to the side. He must be talking to Kent. I took that moment to think about the offer. Learning magic would be ideal and welcome. Who doesn't want to diversify their skill set? Can you imagine getting an avatar who could teleport? Or who could amplify the strength of the elements? Or combine magic with the elements to take down opponents like Superman who were practically invulnerable to everything else apart from a few exceptions, magic being one? That said, I didn't want to stretch myself out too thin and something else told me that there was more to fate's offer than met the eye. I sense, light in you. Your whole being is attuned with order energy and that would make you a powerful practitioner of that branch of mystics. Fate's voice pulled me from my thoughts. I took a second to register his words before I finally understood what he was aiming at. That conniving piece of scrap metal. My face did not reveal the unflattering thoughts I had about the Lord of Order. He was trying to secure a future host in me. Kent was obviously too old and was simply waiting to pass on and reconcile with his wife in the afterlife and Nabu knew that. So once he saw I could channel order magic so easily, he thought he could trick me into learning from him and then later pitching the hole for the greater good speech and convince me to wear the helmet. Fuck him. Seriously, whoever thinks that lords of order are good is dead wrong. My face showed indecision. As if I wanted to take him up on his offer but wasn't sure. Denying him outright would probably make him react badly. I knew my own worth you see. Finally I sighed. 
well let's try and keep up the act. I'm sorry but I can't. I haven't mastered my current abilities. Adding more to the roster would be irresponsible and make me less effective. Maybe after I've mastered what I currently have, I will consider your offer. I bowed for added measure. Fate stared at me for a few seconds and said nothing. He waved his hand and my body tensed, ready to fight. The magic circle from before flashed under me and when I opened my eyes, I found myself near the others who were standing on the bio ship. The Tower of Fate was nowhere to be found. With that, the mission was complete. Hey guys. What do you say we get out of here? Chapter 39 Damaged Bonds Aiden's P.O.V Our feet made synchronized steps through the hallway. Gan had been left behind with the bio ship to carry out some maintenance on her. Due to the fact that I personally knew nothing about the structure and makeup of a Martian bio ship, I proceeded to my room. Connor also decided to do the same. Luckily, we had gotten some takeout before arriving at the base so I wasn't feeling hungry. Good night. I said while turning the knob to my door. Connor's hand grabbed my arm before I could push the door open. I stared at him over my shoulder and raised an eyebrow in question. Connor's blue eyes were stern as he looked at me. We need to talk. His tone was clipped and hard. Okay. I don't know what I did to get the Batman treatment but I'm down for a quick chat. He pulled back his hand and looked apologetic. I'm sorry. I just have a few questions. I hadn't missed the way he had looked at me in the tower. His nose had scrunched up and I had instantly felt like slapping myself for forgetting the clone had superior senses. Which meant he more than likely smelled the acrid scent of Clarion's blood that stubbornly clung to my hoodie. I was burning the thing by the way. That had left me grinding my teeth and readying an excuse but luckily he hadn't called me out in front of everybody. Especially after the talk between Aqualad, Kid Flash, Robin and I. The suspicion would be back and that would set me back by a lot. I wasn't sure this was much better though. Him confronting me while we were just as two meant, he would be keen to read my heart rate and with no one else around, the chances of misdirecting his pointed questions were less. All that said though, I didn't like his attitude. I'm a pretty easygoing guy, all things considered. But letting Connor come onto me like that rubbed me the wrong way. I forced myself to calm down though. Superboy was still in essence, a child. Which meant his emotional range was still growing. More times than not, taking the high road when it came to him was easier than winning an argument. Ask your questions. Don't expect me to answer them all though. His jaw clenched and he crossed his hands on his chest. Why did I smell blood on you? I find it suspicious that apart from Abracadabra, who was knocked out at the very start of the fight, this clarion guy you told us about was conveniently gone before we arrived. What did you Aiden? You're thinking I killed him, huh? I went straight to the heart of the matter. Connor looked thrown off by my straightforwardness. Look Connor, we've had a rough evening. So I'm only going to say this once, I didn't kill Clarion. He looked unsure but still didn't back down. In fact I couldn't kill Clarion and I had to result to some very lethal attacks just to stay alive. That's why the scent of his blood is stuck to my hoodie. Otherwise if I had held back against someone on Dr. Fate's level I wouldn't be standing here. You guys would have come across my dead corpse, instead. Connor looked away and frowned. Right. Why did fate hold you back then? When we teleported, you didn't teleport out with us. What was the deal with that? You told the rest that he messed up the incantation but I don't buy it. I sighed. This was going to drag out and I needed a shower. Okay we're done here. Let's talk more in the morning, Superboy. I made to leave but he gripped my shoulder. What are you hiding Aiden? Okay I was now pissed. I rounded up on the half Kryptonian. You know what, I can't believe that you out of all people has the nerve to suspect me of anything. When you came out of the pod, who was the one person who didn't judge you for your fucking attitude? Who was it that had your back the most? Me. That's who. But I guess that respect and care goes one way doesn't it Connor? At least the big guy is considerate to his friends. 
That struck a nerve. His face scrunched up in anger and he punched the wall next to me. Don't fucking talk to me like you know everything about me. You know nothing. He roared. I looked at him unimpressed. The hand inside my hoodie was tightened into a fist and I wanted nothing more than to bury it on Connor's face. There was a gentle whoosh as Gan rounded up the Connor and stared at us. Um guys, is everything okay? She timidly asked. The tension between Connor and I was palpable. We're done here. I swallowed the anger, turned and opened the door to my room. Aiden Dash. Connor started, but I cut him off. I had had enough of his bullshit. Good night. To both of you. I closed the door behind me and let out a sigh at how dramatic my life had recently gotten. I hate drama. It all feels so unnecessary. My first thought if I was in Connor's shoes would have been to exercise the policy of minding my own fucking business. If the issue had been too delicate to just leave as it was, my approach would not have been as aggressive and out of line. Connor had damaged our friendship a little and the problem with me is that I'm rarely the first to reach out and patch things first. I sighed, things would definitely be awkward in the cave for a few days. In a way, I could understand where he was coming from with all the suspicion. This Connor was different from the one on the screen. Due to Superman appropriately taking him under his wing, some of the big blues principles were rubbing off him. Chief among them being the no-killing rule. And had Superman gotten the same scent of blood, his first move would have been to confront me about it. Connor was just emulating his new mentor. But just because I understood where he was coming from did not mean it wasn't any less annoying. So fuck him and everyone else. What I needed was to keep my eyes on the objective. I wouldn't be sticking around here that long anyway. I took a much-needed shower and come back feeling fresh and with an organized mentality. If Connor's attitude was an indication, most of the team would get angsty and start investigating me upon the slightest slip-up. Which meant I had to move out the things I had hidden in my room to somewhere else secure. Unfortunately, the list of contacts I had decided to make in the underworld were painfully short meaning I had no reputation to help me broker deals with these nefarious characters. That meant I couldn't contact the calculator, if it was actually him, just yet. Which left me with only one other choice. Lucifer. I could stash my things with him for the time being while also carrying out the missions he wanted to give me, which I could use to build a reputation in the underworld. But something told me not to leave the Metatrigger or Cobra Venom with anyone else but me so I needed another idea. The tasks he wanted me to do for him were beneficial to me however so I wouldn't bail on that. Luckily, Batman wouldn't be too suspicious about my L.A. outings as opposed to going anywhere else. But first, before I made contact with the devil, I needed to ensure that I could survive anything he could throw at me. And I also needed to have another identity separate from my Maelstrom one which meant I couldn't use my air bending because Batman would simply compare my outings with the time the incidences took place and figure out that it was me. It was time to learn fire bending, which meant I needed to complete the advancement into air bending Grandmaster. Time to grind the shit out of my sonic subs kill and get it to the level it needed to be. In the meantime, in one of the documents from Galiel's safe, there was a storage unit where he kept his relics from his numerous world travel that I could use to hide the Meta Trigger and the vial of Cobra Venom. The jewelry, I would leave for the time being and sell in Metropolis. The cash would have to stay in my room. It was easier explaining it away than the rest of the stuff. General P.O.V. Clarion lost? That is, unexpected. One of the members of the light spoke up. Yes. It seems we underestimated the children. Another added. Particularly this, aerokinetic boy. Could he be a protege of Red Tornado? Their abilities are similar. This time, it was a woman's voice. Doubtful, a deeper voice countered. Red Tornado has never had a protege all these years. The chances of him deciding to pick one now are slim. Maybe or maybe not. One thing that is clear is that the boy poses a threat to us. Another voice spoke up, his tone was crisp, concise, and oozing with charm. I never pegged you for a coward Luther. 
surely he is but a child. Although his abilities are impressive, he is no Kryptonian to warrant this level of caution. The woman said. The deeper voice from earlier chuckled. Bold of you to insult Luther. However, I'd advise you to exercise some level of grace as befitting your station, your majesty. Luther is no fool and he certainly is not a coward. He must have a point. Let's hear him out first. Luther cleared his throat. As I was saying, the boy seems to know of us. By now, Batman and by extension the League suspect the existence of an antithesis to the Justice League so he could have acquired the information that way. What concerns me the most was how he knew Clarion was a member. There was a brief silence. That is a course for concern. The deeper voice from earlier added. He seemed to hold a position as the head of the meeting. The boy, he had a run-in with a few of my operatives during the Rocket mission. This is one more time, he has stood against our goals. I propose we deal with him. No! Suddenly, in response to Ra's al Ghul's words, Clarion refused. His voice was tripping with acid and a manic hate. Despite none of the members of the Light actually being present in the same room, a grim foreboding feeling came upon everyone. He's mine! You hear that? Myeen! I will make that little shit suffer for the insult he gave to me. If any of you touch him before I do, you shall know despair. There was a roar from Clarion's screen and with a click the screen went off. Well that was as productive a talk as any. Luther added as an afterthought. Chapter 40, The Advancement Trial Part 1 Aiden's P.O.D. The next morning I woke up as usual and left for the training room. Last night's events had left me itching for some action so the first thing I did was go through the obstacle course several times, each time increasing my speed until I had worked up a little sweat. I then went on to lift weights. The Cobra Venom had not really given me that much of an increase, only adding 10 tons to my previous limit, making it so that I could now lift 80 tons. The speed increase was even less noticeable. I was clocking at an impressive 105 miles per hour, which wasn't much but at least my reflexes seemed to have been heightened slightly more. For a bender like me, that was much more welcome than a direct increase in movement speed. Midway through my workout, Connor entered the room. He stopped at the entrance looking unsure but then came forward and stopped before me, silent. I finished my set and sat up, using the towel to soak up the slight sheen of sweat covering my forehead. I want to apologize. He finally said, breaking the silence. I stared up at him and nodded. I wasn't one to hold a grudge anyway. It's fine. Let's just leave it in the past. With that we dropped the matter and I finished up with the workout. Then I left for my favorite spot after nodding to Connor. Things weren't completely okay with us but the subject of our brief but heated argument was hopefully behind us. Gan must have talked some sense into him. Which meant she would try the same with me. Oh boy! I stepped into the beach and breathed in the morning air. I crossed my legs and meditated first. It was an art that airbenders used to feel more in tune with the world and I found that it helped calm my mind whenever I was feeling weighed on by situations. My breath fogged as I breathed in and out, slowly emptying my mind of all thoughts and focusing on the rhythm. I continued the cycle for half an hour or so and then reached out into the world. My touch was tentative. I was asking permission from the air to wield it. With my current level, such a thing was not a must anymore. Just like how the bending moves had become redundant but I always felt the need to humble myself before this force of nature. Forcing the connection would result in domineering power but for finesse and better control, understanding the movements, the essence and the core of the element was the way to go. And this time I felt it, an urge to stop forcing it. To simply let go and trust, trust in that something would hold me afloat even without my control, so I let. Morning Aiden! Gana's chipper voice completely broke my concentration and made me lose it. My heart instantly sunk. I had been so close to, I frowned. I had been so close to something. Hope I didn't interrupt anything. Too late for that. 
I closed my eyes and breathed out before plastering a smile and turning to the ever-excitable girl. No, it's good. How was your night? Great. So Connor told me what happened last night. She began softly, unsure of how I would react. This again? I connected with the air once more and started creating wind constructs. Mmh. I hummed. He didn't really tell me the specifics, but he felt sorry for anything bad he might have said. Mmh. She flew closer to me while I struggled to maintain a twisting polearm in the air. And you guys are really close friends, so I didn't like that you were fighting. The pole arm shot off towards the ocean and unraveled upon contact with the water. A blast of air exploded up, sending the water splashing up in a wave. And I told him to come to you and apologize. And let me guess you promised him you would talk to me too if he did it, huh? What? No. It's not like that. The Martian instantly flushed red and started denying. Look, Megan, it's not your job to try and make us reconcile. I appreciate it, though, and don't worry, Connor and I are good. The Martian bit her lip. Trust me. We're good. I assured her. Great. Hello, Megan. I know exactly what you guys need to put this whole thing behind you. Cookies! My eyes followed her as she flew quickly back into the cave. I shook my head inside. Let's see if I can get that feeling again. Something tells me it's very important. I tried to fall back into meditation, which was easy. But the trance from before, where my whole spirit had been on the verge of freedom, wasn't accessible. Mgana's interruption had thrown me completely off my game. So for the rest of the morning I decided to focus on my sonic abilities. The fight with Clarion had shown me that Black Canary could be devastating if she wanted to. A fully powered sonic blast from her could even take down Superman if he was caught off guard. I wanted to reach that level or barring that at least expert level to unlock the next element which was fire. I massaged my throat softly. The shout I had blasted Clarion with had done a number on my voice but luckily it seemed like the serums had given me enhanced healing. My voice was a bit rough for the time being though. And not to mention, currently I couldn't create a sufficiently powered sonic blast. However, I didn't need to. I focused on maintaining a low but still debilitating sonic wave aimed towards the water. There were slight ripples in the air and an irritating sound produced. Just enough to cause some pain to a normal human being though. I alternated for making the sonic attacks wide and narrow and then tried to practice shooting them out in quick succession. At 10, Gan arrived with a plate of cookies and a glass of milk that she left on a beach chair and left without a word. I was grateful that she was considerate enough to not disrupt me seeing as I was making some progress. I took a quick break, devoured the freshly baked goodies and then it was back to training again. My intense focus saw me shirtless at noon with the sun beating down on my dark skin and a light sheen of sweat covering it. The sonic attacks had become easier and easier to the point where all I had to do was to keep up with the practice to make the skill a part of my fighting style. And just before two, a text box appeared in my vision. I sat down while breathing a bit heavily. Gulping the water again had thoughtfully brought me, I ran a hand through my hair. Despite my stamina being incredible, non-stop power practice under the hot rays of the sun was enough to leave me feeling tired. Especially when you consider that although I didn't run out of the energy to bend, my endurance was still drained as my body did its best to channel that energy into controlling the elements but it was not all for nothing. I looked at the panel and after making sure I was all alone, clicked on it. Air element, master. Flight. Unlocked. Sound. Unlocked. Both of the sub-skills were unlocked. My proficiency level had not changed though, which made me frown. As if sensing my confusion, another panel replaced the one showing my airbending skills. Congratulations. You are now at the precipice of attaining Grandmaster level in the air element. To complete the process you must go through an Advancement trial. Yes. No one said that things would be easy for you. As an ambassador it is your job to be powerful. That is non-negotiable. And for that to happen, you must be tested fully. 
but don't say we are completely merciless. If you succeed in passing the trial, a new system function will be unlocked. P.S. Whenever you're ready, tap on the minimize system display at the corner of your vision for you to be transported to the trial ground. P.P.S. The trial will happen only once for every element. So don't fail this attempt or else your air bending will be stuck at master level. P.P.P.S. This goes without saying but the trial will be taken alone with no outside help or weapons. To that end, your other abilities will be restrained for you to showcase pure airbending mastery. P.P.P.P.S. Success will be determined through submission, knockout, or death. I sucked in a deep breath. This, this was unexpected. It just went to show that although the Avatar system was based from the animated series, it wasn't an accurate copy. This seemed more like a power progression, where I would be rewarded as long as I hit checkpoints or completed certain objectives. I smiled. That meant the issue of an avatar's low firepower when compared to people like Superman or Wonder Woman didn't apply to me. Though even that was debatable seeing that some avatars like Avatar Zeto were fucking scary. Zeto could induce the eruption of four volcanoes which was a feat that at estimate would require around 40 megatons of TNT. For perspective the most powerful nuclear bomb ever detonated by the human race, the Tsar Bomba, is around 50 to 58 megatons of TNT. So Zeto was able to scale up to nuclear weapons. Then there's Avatar Kyoshi, who created the island named after her by separating a landmass from the continent and pushing it out into the ocean. At the upper levels, an avatar was easily continental level. The problem was that this was the DC verse. Superman at the lowest was planetary. Not to mention the sheer number of people close to his level like Shazam, Manhunter, Wonder Woman, Captain Atom, the Lanterns, and in my opinion the scariest of them all, the Flash. Sooner or later in the future, the Justice League and I will collide due to my ideals and when that day comes, I need to be powerful enough not to lose. I spared a look at the icon at the edge of my sight. And that is how I would do it. Chapter 41, The Advancement Trial Part 2 Aiden's P.O.V A few hours later after my practice, shower and dinner, Batman called us for a debrief on what went down at the Tower of Fate. Due to the fact that I was the most involved, I ended up recounting the whole thing from top to bottom. Batman's question ranged from my decisions to a detailed description of Clarion. I answered all of his questions and held nothing back. When he was satisfied, he released the others and requested for me to stay back. I caught the tail end of Wally's he's so busted inside. Staring at the dark night, I couldn't come up with a counter-argument to Wally's statement. Fate offered you a chance to learn magic but you turned him down. Why? Batman glared at me and questioned. Wow. You went straight for the jugular. Can't say I'm surprised though. Answer me. If it was possible, the glare increased in intensity. I held up a hand and chuckled. Got it, no more jokes. My face turned serious. The Lords of Order seek to maintain the status quo. They are not inherently good. They are just the opposing side to chaos. Remove chaos from the equation completely and you get an overpowered prick like Nabu who doesn't need to conform to the moral rules and boundaries we mortals abide by. Batman tightened his hands into fists. You're suggesting that Dr. Fate is only on our side for convenience sake and not out of an obligation to help. Need I remind you that he was part of the Justice Society? I shook my head. No, what I'm saying is that you cannot treat Nabu as a human. His duty to counter Clarion and other Lords of Chaos comes first and foremost before everything else. Good and bad are just two extreme ends of values that we as emotional creatures give meaning to. If Tanabu order means the death of a million people. I left that part unsaid. Batman gave a curt nod. You still haven't explained why you refused to learn magic from him. I snorted, giving him a knowing look. Oh Bruce, if there's someone who understands you it's me. Someone who has seen almost every iteration of your character. I shuddered in fear, briefly thinking of the Batman who laughs. True, but that's because you already know the answer to that. You probably already did even before I walked in for the debriefing. 
I said while leaning back, confident in my assumption. Batman stapled his fingers together. Enlighten me. Okay. So he wants to verify his suspicions through me. Nabu seeks a host. He knows that Kent is way past his prime and will soon pass on, leaving Nabu without a way to interact with the outside world. The whole thing still bothered me due to how close I'd come to losing my body. It is to my understanding that Kent Nelson gave his word to Nabu that he would find him a host before that happens. Batman replied. I shook my head. That was probably the plan, until I showed up. Nabu sensed that I possess an affinity for his brand of magic and now. He wants to groom you into his future host. Batman cut me off. If what you say is true then proper measures will need to be taken regarding the helmet. One thing I can tell you is that under no circumstances should you let Zatanna wear it. If that happens, Zatara will give himself over to Nabu willingly and without fail and the Justice League will lose its expert on magic. One might argue that the trade-off is worth it because you'd be getting Dr. Fate but after everything I've told you, would you take that chance? Our eyes met and Batman gave an intimidating HN that would have made an Uchiha jealous. This matter is no longer your concern. The League will handle it from here. With that, I got up, understanding I was being dismissed. Send Aqualad in. Batman added before I closed the door behind me. A while later. Hey, you up for a spar? Connor asked me as we waited for Aqualad to come and brief us on our next mission. To be honest, I was feeling a bit angsty. I wanted to do nothing more than lock myself in my room and do the advancement trial, but now we had another mission on the horizon. Not to mention, Superboy wanted to spar. Knowing his anger issues, although they'd been lessened in our previous clash, this wouldn't turn out so well so. Maybe later, Connor. I'm still feeling tapped out from exercise. I gently refused. No need for him to feel like I curved him. Even though I totally did. Cool. He clenched his jaw and turned away, crossing his hands on his chest. I ignored him and looked around at the others. Kid Flash was busy flirting with an unsuspecting Megan. A Megan who had his attention on Connor, looking worried and yearning at the same time. Robin and Artemis both looked our way upon hearing Connor's words. I narrowed my eyes at the boy wonder as he watched on with interest. His gaze jumping from Connor to me rapidly. He could no doubt sense the tension between us comes with being a mini Batman, I guess. That might make him curious, leading to him questioning Connor on what went down between us, leading to Connor telling him about his suspicions, leading to the boy wonder investigating me leading to, God. Why can't anything just be simple? Fortunately, Aqualad arrived with Batman in tow. We have our new task. We're deploying at 1,800 hours tomorrow for a recon mission at the Yellowstone National Park. Aqualad started while pointing at the hollow map displayed by the projector. Yellowstone National Park? That sounds like I looked at the dark night and met his eyes. A brief nod and I understood. Batman had finally decided to use some of the information I'd given him. Which admittedly wasn't a lot, but the red volcano threat couldn't be left to chance. It had been the very first thing I had warned him about because of how serious the threat was. Tio Moro could destroy the whole world without anyone knowing by simply activating Red Volcano. His stupidity in trying to get Red Tornado back was the only reason the team had had a chance to destroy the overpowered android. We're going to do a full sweep of the place. Leaving no stone unturned until we find out Tio Moro's hideout. Got it? Aqualad finished. I nodded along with the others, but my mind was on something else. Completing the advancement trial tonight had just become all the more crucial. I needed to be Grandmaster level if we were going to go up against Red Torpedo, Red Inferno and God forbid Red Volcano. The worst part? They all had elemental base powers on the level of Red Tornado. General P.O.V., Dick Grayson, an hour after the brief. His behavioral pattern indicates a power-hungry mindset. Probably as a need to feel secure after underscore 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 underscore. He obsesses over power. More often than not training to perfect the abilities he has access to while seeking to gain more. 
an introvert, opinionated yet content to keep silent just as much he speaks his mind, keenly observant, follows orders as long as they are reasonable and holds a slight derision for others, probably a side effect of learning about underscore 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 and its parallels from. Why are there redacted words on his profile? Dick asked while reading the information contained in Aiden's file. Suddenly the computer screen displayed a not authorized text box. No, no, no. Robin turned his sight back to his wrist-mounted computer and tried to swipe through it quickly. He'd connected the device to the back computer's database after hacking it to get information on Aiden. Please, please, tell me I got it. Robin sighed in disappointment. I didn't get it. The elevator doors to the back cave opened and Robin's hands swiftly ran through the back computer's controls. The screen went black and Boy Wonder turned around with his heart pumping. How was Batman back so quickly? Usually a league meeting took hours before it ended. Master Grayson. Robin swallowed his sigh of relief. Oh, hey, Alfred. Playing games on the back computer again? Robin groaned. That was one time, Alfred, and I was ten. You're never going to let me live that down, are you? Alfred chuckled and walked in. Unlikely. The aged butler went over to a table, placed away from the technology dotting most of the cave and placed down the tea set he was carrying. Now, Master Grayson. I believe it's time we had a discussion on what privacy means. Dick widened his eyes slightly before doubling down on his stubbornness and deciding to play innocent. I have no idea what you're talking about, Alfred. But I would be willing to listen if it wasn't for a prior engagement with Kid and Aqualad. Anyway, I'm open to rescheduling this talk for another time. I doubt that a dash. Robin quickly caught himself and cleared his throat. Stalwart gentleman at the prime of your life gets out much and hence must seek other alternatives to entertain himself. You can call me old, Master Grayson. I don't mind. Despite saying that, a dangerous glint on Alfred's eyes advised the young hero not to. Robin gulped and wished he was dealing with Killer Croc. None of his tricks were going to work on the former British soldiers. Old? Surely you're joking, Alfred. Instead of disparaging yourself, my advice would be to stay prorogued instead. Anyway, see you later. I'm off to patrol. With that, Dick turned and went towards the elevator. An alert came through to me that you were accessing files you were not authorized to. Alfred's voice stopped him dead on his tracks. Dick closed his eyes and muttered damn it under his breath. Welp, there goes rule number 46. Don't get caught. Robin thought, semi-joking, referring to the guidelines Batman had taught him to pay close attention to. Now, you can go on your patrol and come back later to deal with Master Bruce or you can stay and have a cup of this freshly brewed tea I just made with me. Either way, this is happening. Choose your poison, Master Grayson. Dick couldn't stop the groan that came out of his mouth. He didn't want to deal with Batman's glare, so Alfred was obviously the better choice. Fine, but let's chess things up. I need at least a win in something. With a sigh, Robin responded. Alfred's smirk told Dick that he might have made another mistake. The older gentleman suddenly looked eager. My thoughts exactly. Chapter 42, The Advancement Trial Final Part Aiden's P.O.V. My chest inflated with a deep breath. I held it for 30 seconds and then exhaled, staying like that for 30 more seconds. Then I repeated the cycle for 10 minutes, falling into a rhythm that helped calm my nerves for what I was about to do. I opened my eyes and maximized the text box for the Advancement Trial and clicked Start. I didn't feel my head hit the pillow. My surroundings had suddenly changed within the blink of an eye. I looked around, trying to get a sense of what was happening. All around me was a grayish mist that obscured the whole area. What what ISS happening? I wondered, frowning at the odd way my voice resonated and echoed all around me. Another text box blinked into being before my eyes. You have initiated the start of your advancement trial to Grandmaster level in airbending. If you're still unsure of your current capabilities to complete this trial, this is your final chance to back out and retake the trial once you feel you're ready. 
If you still wish to continue, click yes. I hesitated. There was nothing cowardly about turning back. To be completely honest, I wasn't 100% confident that I could win this. However, I didn't really have a choice. I had put a lot of expectations on myself. And I'd be damned if I turned back because of the risk. I clicked yes. Nothing happened except for another text box replacing the one I already had opened. There were only two ominous words on the blue text box. Good luck. I sucked in a deep breath. Okay, let's do tea. Instantly, I took a knee, my words getting cut off as I struggled to breath. My body felt so sluggish and heavy. I looked at the ground and saw it shift into a hard and rocky terrain. The whole gray space instantly changed into a very familiar battlefield. I was standing on a pillar of stone looking out towards the rocky landscape with a river running through it. My heart grew cold. I swallowed. I'm facing him? I mean it makes sense, but him? Of all people. Why couldn't you give me some nondescript airbending master like, like Gyatso or even that son of his that became an airbender after Korra and an Alex battle? Why of all things, would you match me up with the Avatar himself? Why ain't? Fucking hell. Another text box appeared in my vision. Your opponent has similarly been restricted to only airbending. That was better. If it was only airbending then I could win this. Somehow. I firmed up my will and gathered all the confidence I had. My eyes met his. Aang was in his younger years. The same age he was in canon when he defeated Fire Lord Ozai. I thanked God for that small mercy. Adult Aang would have been impossible to beat. Not only because of how fucking strong he had to be after mastering all the bending styles and refining them but also because of his mature mentality. Young Aang was unsure of himself, carried massive guilt, refused to kill and always doubted his strength. That meant I could use all that to my advantage. His face was blank with no emotion but I could see a glint of understanding as to what was about to happen. Meaning he had enough cognition to attack, defend, strategize and hopefully listen and process my words when I talked. That would probably come in handy. Aang was a big softy after all. That plan was shelved for the time being as a last resort. First I wanted to test myself and see if I could win this the right way. The combat trial way. Who knew when I could get another chance like this to go up against a veteran airbender? I settled into an stance. The air moved according to my urging, dancing through the open space as I controlled it to surround me. I shifted my leg and spinned, sending an air slash towards Aang. The avatar pushed one foot forward and did nothing as the air slash uselessly made contact with his body and dispelled. What? That brief moment of shock almost cost me. A whitish cone of concentrated wind left Aang's fist and quickly arrived before me. I leaned back and watched as the attack flew over me, my eyes wide. The power. The strength of his air attacks felt indomitable. I rose up and started sending barges of wind attacks. Air kicks, air cannons, cones of wind and wind weapon constructs that would wreck the surroundings if it was the real world. But none of them did a thing. Aang danced out of the way of the attacks, looking completely at ease, evading and blocking. It was clear that he had much more experience. There was something he possessed that allowed him to trump the quality of my air bending no matter how much power I fed to it. Fuck this. I reached outwards and created tornadoes all around him. I flew up high and sent the numerous whirlwinds his way. The pillars we had been standing on were promptly destroyed, with the pieces of rock breaking off and joining the windstorm. I grimly looked on down at Aang's position. The tornadoes decimated the surroundings, leaving behind a crater but in the middle of those turbulent winds was a section that remained untouched. Aang calmly stood inside a bubble of wind. His hand came up with two fingers outstretched that he slowly lowered. Following this action, the cyclones destabilized. Then he waved his right hand in a swaying motion, seamlessly stretched his left leg to the side, pulled his hands to hips and then boom. Threw the palms forward. My eyes were entranced. His movements, his motions, they all flowed so naturally with the air. 
I finally understood what I was missing. Synchronization with the element. In comparison, my movements were crude, primal, and stiff. Undeserving of the master title one had access to. It also made a lot of sense why my flying was so different from Zahir's. Whatever this thing, A and Zahir and probably every other bender who had to learn without the pre-programmed set of arts and motions the system fed me, I didn't have it. I wasn't as in tune with the air as I should have been. Which bugged the heck out of me and made me wonder why the system still graded me as a master. Questions that were cut off by the unimpressive but efficiently deadly air attack that Avatar Aang threw forward. The large cone of air slammed into my air shield, throwing me further up into the air. I tried to wrest control of the air but failed. So I pushed back with my own attack. Putting everything I had behind it. There was an explosion of wind that pushed everything away, including me. The closest outcrops of rock and earth were detached forcefully, leaving behind dust that obscured the surroundings. I coughed and waved a hand, sending a burst of elemental power outwards, clearing my immediate vicinity of dust. I frowned as a large shape appeared below me, growing prominent by the second. A huge fucking rock. Holy shit. I thought he was restricted to only air bending. My hands came up and the fingers danced in the air, in a mimic of a puppeteer. One of my least used applications of air bending because of how dangerous it was, activated. Invisible wind constructs of wires shot out in a deadly fashion. Unseen but heard, a whistling sound left behind. The constructs sliced apart the rock into smaller pieces that flew right by me. Aang suddenly leaped from one of the larger pieces flying away on my left. His leg kicked out and the pieces of rock projectiles were pushed towards me, answering the question of how he'd thrown the huge boulder at me in the first place. He was using air bending. Something that I could also do. I got out of my surprise quickly and a tornado formed around me, pulling the projectiles along its twisting motion and then releasing it back to the avatar. The air bubble surrounding Aang disappeared for a second and with practiced ease, he stepped on the rocks meant to hit him. I felt frustration hit me along with anger. My better judgment won out and I studied him. Looking for an opening while also learning. Clearly a real airbender had me trumped in understanding of what airbending was. It wasn't just an art like I'd believed before, it was a lifestyle. A culture steeped in philosophy that these people learned from childhood. My measly few weeks as an airbender couldn't compare. What I had was power and ingenuity on my side, but the control I had hitherto thought was prodigious, was not even worth mentioning. I couldn't win this. Not like this. Not now, here goes the last resort. Forgive me Aang, but I need to throw you off your game. My right hand, which I had kept behind me suddenly stretched out. An air bomb, the same one I had used on Cobra exploded with the force of a real bomb. The shockwaves impacted Aang's shield bubble and threw him downwards. Aang managed to dispel the attack in time before his body could hit the ground. Behind him, the attack continued, sending a large volume of water overflowing towards the banks of the river below us. The wind reached out gently like a mother holding her baby and carried him down to land on a lone outcrop of stone, the others having been destroyed during our fight. He was just about to jump back at me, but I held up a hand. Here goes nothing. An expression of mockery appeared on my face. It's funny that out of all the possible avatars I could face, I got the weakest. The worst. The one who abandoned his duty and left everyone to die. I mean talk about a loser. The words left a bitter taste in my mouth. This, this was wrong but it's just a projection hardwired into emulating Aang. Please, please don't let it be the real him. The air was suddenly supercharged with something. Hurricanes picked up all around us and grew with intensity at every drop of my words. I wonder what Gyatso thought and felt when the firebenders got to him, did he shed tears, seeing the destruction they caused to your home? I wonder if he cursed your name as he died. Wondering why you were ever born as the Avatar. Aang's body shook as the breeze from before grew in intensity, forming sharp licks of winds. Breathing became a labor, prompting me to create a bubble around my body. He's angry, but I need him broken. You abandoned the people who needed you the most. 
Frankly speaking, the world lost its avatar way before you ran away from your duty, they lost the avatar the day Rocket died. Aang's eyes started to flash white as an animalistic shout of anger exploded out of his mouth. The avatar stayed. My mouth dried up as I tightened my fingers. There was only one more sentence left, one more statement and I'd break him. Could I do it? Your whole existence is meaningless because at the end of the day, all your struggles, your friends, the love of your life Katara, none of it is real. None of you are real, you're just characters created to entertain people. All that death and suffering was simply for my viewing pleasure. The wind died down. The tornadoes unraveled and everything went calm. Aang lost the light in his eyes and knelt down. A river of tears fell down his now blank and emotionless face. Despite it being a copy of the real self, what I had done was repugnant. I flew down gently towards him and flicked a finger. A wire construct slashed out from Aang's right side and came out on the other side visible and colored red. I then opened my mouth and for added measure, a sonic attack rippled out, breaking his body apart. I never looked away. Turns out yes, I could do it. I could break someone's spirit. Chapter 43, Airbending Grandmaster Aiden SP.O.V I closed my eyes and finally turned away. When I opened them, I found myself somewhere else. The rocky landscape had changed into a mist-filled highland with mountain peaks, scattered trees growing out of the rocky lands and clouds that hung close to the earth, showing just how high I was. The sun shone brightly above the sky, but even its rays could not trump the cold breeze that blew, ruffling my clothes. I looked around and felt the calmness of the whole area wash over me. There was a shadow that hang above head. I turned to see what it was and a sigh at the majestic sight escaped my mouth. The Southern Air Temple. The place where Aang called his home. To reinforce that claim, there was a field on one of the peaks where a popular airbending sport called airball was played. The posts stuck out straight, looking untouched by time. Even thinking of Aang sent a pang of regret at how the whole trial had gone down. I took a deep breath to center myself. I can't change the past. For my ideals, I have to move forward. I repeated that statement for a few more times like a mantra. It helped to self-hypnotize myself into adopting the right mindset. A mindset of understanding that I could not change what had already occurred and instead focus on seeing through my objectives. I breathed out, finally having calmed myself enough to wonder, where the hell was I? Or better yet, why the hell was I in a place that closely resembled the Southern Air Temple from Avatar? I was supposed to receive a text box from the system telling me I had completed the advancement trial. I doubt I had to beat another airbender to get to Grandmaster level. Aang seemed more than enough. Too much for me to bear even, seeing as I had to resort to other ways. So this must be something else. And given the fact that I found myself here at the homeland of the airbenders, I had a feeling on where exactly I was supposed to go. My steps were light as I moved forward, steadily approaching the entrance of the temple. The whole building felt grim, abandoned and sacred. Vines grew along its walls. And the path leading down the mountain was full of weeds, showing that it hadn't been used for quite some time. I stepped through the entrance which emptied out into a courtyard. The architecture was impressive. The wall fence, keeping people from a deep dive into the unknown was constructed by a great craftsman showing nowhere it were tear despite the fighting that had occurred here, if this was actually an authentic copy of the Southern Air Temple. Which it was, given the fact that I spotted one or two firebender helmets. In the middle of the courtyard was a statue of a monk in a cross-legged position. The resemblance to Aang was uncanny. His name was Monk Gyatso and he'd been a father figure slash master to him. I looked at him and once more thought of Aang. This time, however, I had fully accepted what had happened. So I walked forward and bowed in respect. My head rose up and I took the stairs, continuing along the hallway and arriving before a door constructed in a weird fashion. Two large megaphone-like objects with tubes growing out of their ends and crisscrossing crossing each other in a maze-like display were framed on the main entrance. I remembered Aang telling Katara and Sokka that only an airbender could open this door. 
I feel into a stance and manipulated the air to shoot out of both of my palms at the same time and into the holes made like diameter horns. The doors were the entrance to the air temple sanctuary. If there was a place I could get answers, this was it. The air made a deep groaning sound as I pushed it into the tubes, leading to two locks on the middle section of the door clicking down and aligning with a third one. With that, the door swung open. A smell of mildew and dust hit me as I stepped through. This room was supposedly more sacred than anything else in the temple. The atmosphere it gave off showed there was some truth in that. My feet stepped through the darkness and I belatedly realized I could have given anything for my serum powers to come back. Especially the senses. The darkness on my sides totally blinded me in a way I had never felt before. Even adaptive physiology was similarly suppressed. The light from the outside fortunately allowed me to walk forwards unhindered. The Air Temple Sanctuary housed the statues of all the previous avatars. My eyes swept through the whole area and I gaped. Instead of all the reincarnated avatars, there was only one statue. Mine. I was dressed in my ideal superhero costume. The costume idea I had in my head and, and I looked older. Somehow, this statue was a representation of me as an avatar. Did that mean that when I died I would reincarnate into another life? Better yet, what was my avatar state if I didn't have past lives to draw knowledge from? I'd always known I wasn't a normal avatar. But this, this confirmed I had no idea how deep the rabbit hole went. The statue itself was pristine and gleaming in the little light that reached the room. I gingerly advanced to it and stopped. As if I was in a trance, I reached out a hand and touched it. I opened my eyes and found myself on a peak of some sort. My body was sitting cross-legged on the ground and everywhere I looked I saw clouds beneath me. I was dressed in air-bending robes that felt warm and snug on my body. The sun was shining down at my head and a heavy wind assaulted me from all directions. My breathing came out hurried and fast. Where was I now? And what was the deal with showing me the Southern Air Temple? I completed the advancement trial, stopped playing games with me, and dash. My words were cut off by the sudden appearance of a text box. Congratulations in completing the advancement trial. Your results have been tarried and the rewards promised will be given to you after you exit this space. Do you wish to exit? Of course, wait. My finger stopped in mid-air before I could click on the exit key. What was I doing? I can't believe I almost made such a big blunder. Such a mistake would have seen me regret everything. If I had learned anything from the system, it's that it never did anything without a reason. So why would it decide to send my spirit here if it was just going to allow me to leave the very first minute I requested it? I waved the text box away. Maybe the advancement trial wasn't done. Maybe this was the other portion of the trial. Relying on the system to magically give me the power and experience of a Grandmaster Airbender was incredibly short-sighted and foolish. This was something I had to do myself. What the system had done was provide me with the best place to do it. The peak I was sitting on was constantly buffeted with air from all sides. The best place for an airbender to train. I took a deep breath and slowly let it out, falling into my usual rhythm. It was hard. Especially with the constant whistling the air made when it swayed by me. Difficult as it was, I doubled down on my stubbornness and after some time, I calmed down. The whistling sound of the air went from being annoying to comforting. The difficulty in breathing lessened, my chest exhaling and inhaling once every minute. My mind emptied of all distraction as I fell into the same trance that I had been in during the time Gan had disrupted my training. A trance where every single part of me had grown connected to the air around me. And it was in that position, I confirmed all my previous conclusions. In comparison to a true airbending master like Aang, I was merely an expert practitioner. The rankings in the system was not a clear representation of skill. Instead, it was a representation of power. Of how much damage I could do with airbending because, in the DC verse, what mattered most wasn't skill. Not really. Not when facing beings like Darkseed. Madame Shiva was the greatest martial arts along with Richard Dragon, but they could never face off against someone like Sinestro head-on and win. 
In that same train of thought, my flight was imperfect. It wasn't backed by the true spirit of airbending, instead it was because of my sufficient control and the amount of power I shoved into the sub's kill. It was unrefined. I could have made it into something more. But I hadn't seen past my immediate success. So the system measured my proficiency in terms of power and not skill. That's why Aang had bested me in the same element. And the only way I could bridge that gap is by becoming more than Aang. It was more than mastering the required 36 airbending moves or creating my own to earn my airbending tattoos and become a recognized airbending master. It was by becoming the air itself. Let go your earthly tether. Enter the void. Empty and become wind. I repeated Guru Lagima's mantra. Over and over again. Zahir had achieved flight by merely letting go off his earthly attachments. Granted it was the death of his girlfriend that had been the final fuse he needed but, I had the same grief too. Within the blink of an eye, I had lost everyone I had ever known my entire life. My parents, my relatives, my friends, and my real life. The pain was always there. Burning and cutting me deep inside, despite the picture I portrayed on the outside. I hadn't really dealt with it. Believing that time would heal the wound in my heart and I'd forget the agony. However, I had to face it. I was probably never going back. Their faces ran through my mind on loop and I forced myself to remember all the good times and the memories filled with life. Bad and good. And then, I let go of all of it. Chapter 44 The Rewards Aiden's P.O.V The pain and agony faded away. The fear for the future and the regrets of the past followed right behind and for the first time in ever, I felt, weightless. A whole new world opened up to me and I cursed myself for being so blind before. The air was alive. Not in the sense of sentience but something so, authentic, free, temperamental and connected to everything couldn't be anything less than alive. I floated serenely with barely a draft ruffling my clothes as compared to my previous flight skill. The air carried me of its own volition. I was in the state of weightlessness, a form I maintained by detaching myself of all worries. This was what Zahir had. The epitome of airbending. The Grandmaster level. I flew over the southern air temple and across the numerous tall mountain tops. My speed had increased but the best part to all this was the free movement. I could stop and accelerate to my full speed almost instantaneously. On top of that, all my airbending skills had become easier to use and more efficient. My control had really gone to Aang's level. I spent hours learning about what I could now do, before I sat down, maximized the text box display and clicked exit. My last sight of the place was the lone temple, abandoned but intact and majestic. I opened my eyes and found myself on my bed. I got up and stretched waiting away the numerous text boxes in my vision to the corner of my sight. I gulped down a glass of water and looked at the time. Only an hour had passed, showing that time was not relative while I was in the advancement trial grounds. Inside, it had felt like days. By all rights I should be exhausted, but despite the arduous fight with Aang, I felt fresh, free and light. I waved a hand and a soft breeze followed the direction of my hand. I chuckled in glee at what I was feeling. I had never felt so in sync with air before. It was eager to jump to do my bidding. As if I wasn't a separate component but a part of it. I snapped a finger and instantly all the air in the room was sucked into the form of a ball. It was the size of a basketball and swirled in my hand. I kept the vacuum up by restricting more air from flowing into the empty space. Splitting my attention into two fronts, even that felt easy. A blinking icon at the corner of my eyes brought my attention back to something equally interesting as my new and improved airbending control. There would be more time to experiment but now I had something else to check. There was supposed to be a reward for completing the advancement mission as well as a new system function. I went over to my bed and sat on it before maximizing the full system display to hover in my vision. You have successfully completed the advancement trial. After comprehending the intricacies of weightlessness, a high-level understanding of air, your proficiency has gone up to Grandmaster level. 
These efforts have been rewarded with a new perk smiley face. Dragon Fist, air variation, combine air bending with chi blocking to send a small shockwave through a target's body, successfully knocking them out. With each unlocked element, variations of the technique can be acquired upon completion of the advancement trial to Grandmaster level. Wow! Excitement coursed through me as I read through the workings of the technique. This, this was good. Especially for disarming goons without the need for zip ties or hitting them on the head, which had a risk of head injury. The excitement wasn't because of the technique per se, but the possibility of getting an even cooler variation of the technique. What would be a water dragon fist variation? I couldn't wait to find out. The problem was how I would practice the technique. Truth be said, I was wary to test out a new move on my friends or anyone who didn't deserve it. Luckily, the new system function had the perfect solution for that. A new system function has been unlocked smiley face. Training points are you running into the trouble of finding appropriate opponents? Opponents with the same power system and skills that can help you push your bending to its pinnacle? Worry no more! After every successful mission you complete in the real world, you can get points that can be used to purchase sparring partners from the Avatar Systems database. P.S. Only benders for unlocked elements can be purchased. Current unlocked elements include Air Element, Grandmaster Weightlessness Sound Fire Element, Beginner, Unlocked Locked Locked PPS Avatars will only be available for access after unlocking all the four elements. PPPS, up to one rank above your current element proficiency will be available for purchase. PPPPS, upon purchase of a character, your spirit will be transported into the training ground, a place that will match the elements being used where you will face off against your chosen opponent. I whistled in appreciation. The new function was a godsend. My battle with Aang showed me that although I knew the general forms and stances of airbending, I didn't possess the battle knowledge or experience needed to seamlessly flow from one move to another. By purchasing different sparring partners, I could at least go up against other benders like me and perfect my battle forms. The way the function was set was also in line with the Avatar system's guidelines to not make it easy for me. I would still be the one risking my life to get the training points just to use them to buy sparring partners not to mention the limitations imposed upon the function. Wouldn't it be easier if I just fought supervillains with elemental powers like the numerous ice villains around? Not really. It wasn't efficient as having your own opponent on call. Plus it also carried the threat of death. I looked at the bottom section of the display and felt my mood plummet a little. Training points, zero. I hoped that the points from my previous missions had been accrued and stored, but apparently not. No use in fretting over that though. On other matters, I jumped from my bed and settled in a basic horse stance. Think hot. Think combustion. A heat wave rising from the core of your being. My mouth opened and steam came out of it. Think of a blaze, consuming everything in its path. My body grew warm. Think of fire. An unquenchable inferno. I stepped forward and threw my hand out. A few licks of flames escaped my palm and were quickly snuffed out. What? I looked on disbelief. That's all I had? A few licks of flames not even enough to light a candle? When I started practicing airbending, my first try was much more impressive than that. I sighed and straightened up. What am I doing? I have a mission tomorrow for Chris Sake. Though it's thankfully in the evening, I should still get some sleep. I resolved to try out fire bending in the morning and settled inside my sheets. Tomorrow the team was going to fight Tio Moro and his androids. Earlier, I hadn't known what to think of that except for the fear of Red Volcano, but now, with my new proficiency along with Red Tornado coming along as an overseer, something the others were not particularly happy about, we could take them on. We could do this. I closed my eyes and quickly fell asleep. Santa Prisca. A shadow sped through the thicket, undetectable to the men with guns patrolling around. The shadow took a leap, jumped to the bark of a tree, swung on the branch, and in the same motion, an arrow with a cord was released towards the other side of the river. 
the arrow dug itself onto a branch and red arrow swung across. His landing was soft and silent, just like it should have been. No wasted movements whatsoever. He allowed himself a brief smile upon catching glimpse of the factory that was supposed to be destroyed, looking whole and freshly rebuilt from the bushes he was hiding in. A chopper was parked out front before the building and Red Arrow's eyes widened upon seeing who it was. Lex Luthor's assistant. Which meant. Luthor was involved. Somehow. Red Arrow hid behind a tree as a patrol team of two passed by his position, smoking while conversing in Spanish. He swallowed a scoff, so far Bane's security was turning out to be child's play especially considering how far they'd gone to keep the island itself inaccessible. Heat sensors, motion sensors, drones, hidden cameras, numerous patrols and active traps. So far, the patrol teams were the failing part. Though Red Arrow couldn't really blame them. He was good at his job. Really good. Good enough to notice the shadow creeping up behind him, just as undetectable as he was. Good enough to give no indication that he knew someone was behind him. A kunai came to rest on his neck, but he already had an arrow clutched in his hand, above Cheshire's solar plexus. Drop it or we both die messy deaths. The kunai was withdrawn and the supervillainess flipped away. Oh, you say the most romantic things. Cheshire replied while twirling a deadly sigh. Red Arrow would have never let anyone else get that close to him. However, he wanted to reinforce whatever notions Cheshire entertained about their relationship. Sooner or later she would slip up and then, he would strike. Normally Red Arrow was straightforward and direct but no one said he couldn't be cunning if he wanted to. Cheshire, at this point, I'm starting to think you're stalking me. He said while on the lookout for her partner. Sportsmaster. They were usually seen together. Cheshire cocked her hip to the side. Guilty as charged. What else is a girl supposed to do to get your attention? Red Arrow jumped away in time to avoid a long metallic javelin from skewering through him. An arrow escaped his bow and dug itself on a tree, missing the intended target. Sportsmaster landed on the ground next to Cheshire and faced off against Red Arrow. Do you always have to play with your food? He asked Cheshire. What do you expect? It's in the name. She quipped smoothly. Trust me, this is a meal you don't want to play with Kitty Cat. Red Arrow interrupted while notching an arrow, but before he could release it, Sportsmaster spoke up. Broken Arrow. Red Arrow stilled, going into a trance. His eyes grew blank and he lowered his weapon. From the shadows, a new individual appeared. Excellent. I have so many questions I'm dying to ask our friend here. Lex Luthor said, Chapter 45, Machinations Volume 2, Fire General P.O.V. The screen came on with a snap, showing a neatly dressed bald-headed handsome man. Luther smiled lightly, revealing a neat set of teeth as he stared at the refined-looking man in a doctor's coat and a light mustache from the other end of the screen. Luther, what do you want? I told Anthony I want no part in whatever little games you're involved in. My work comes first. Tio Moro said, barely waiting for Luther to talk. Lex swallowed the rude comment he had about the mad scientist with practiced ease. After all, he wasn't the first annoying person he dealt with on a daily basis. There was seven billion more on the planet even. Professor, I suppose I caught you at a bad time. My apologies. Lex started off courteously, his voice smooth and not at all thrown off by the annoyance apparent on Moro's face. Fine. I accept your apology. Now speak up. I have more pressing matters to deal with than entertaining you. Mercy, who was behind Lex, tightened her fingers into fists. Luckily she had her hands clasped behind her, ensuring that Lex didn't notice her slight anger at the way Moro was addressing him. Lex smoothly reached out a hand and patted her on the arm. Oh, believe me, Professor, you will want to listen to what I have to say. A glass of gout de diamonds, my dear. Mercy turned on her heel and left to do as ordered. Moro's eyes showed a trace of interest. You're not a man I take lightly, Luther. 
Don't make me lose that respect for you if this turns out to be nothing. Mora warned. Luther's face turned serious. It has recently come to my attention that a particular group of sidekicks are about to crash into your base professor. They know of your whereabouts and I estimate you have less than a day before they arrive. Moro's eyes bulged out of their sockets. A panicked look crossed his face. He was so close. Red Volcano was complete but he hadn't completed the upload. Volcano was going to be his greatest creation. His magnum opus. How had the League's daycare members found out of his location? His Teton County lab was supposed to be a secret. How? How did they know? Was it Anthony? No, Anthony would never stoop so low. Professional courtesy and his pride wouldn't allow him. Was it you, Luther? If it was. You insult me, Thomas. Can I call you Thomas? Lex interrupted. He took a sip of his drink and looked back at the premier android maker in the world. You need to calm down. I have a way we can both get what we want. Lex's voice was soft yet contained an undeniable charm in its tilt that forced you to listen. Tio Moro was not an exception. Ten minutes later, Lex leaned back on his chair and stapled his fingers together. Did you learn something from this conversation, Mercy? He asked his ever-quiet assistant. Yes. Luther nodded at her answer. Well, out with it then. You're purposefully downplayed the Junior Justice League's team strength. Mercy replied. I did. Why? Lex's smile changed into a cunning one. One of the main reasons behind all this is to test his power, not to kill him. A child possessing control over all the classical elements would no doubt rub Moro the wrong way, causing him to respond accordingly with lethal violence and terminate him or study him. I'm leaning more towards the former. Moro's calling card is his androids and he seems to hold a derision towards our more traditional biological makeup. Lex said while holding up his hand towards the light. You could see the red coloring caused by the light shining through his skin. This way, he gets to owe me a favor, I get to see the depths of Maelstrom's full power, test out our benefactor's more esoteric technology and if Moro gets captured by the children, all the more better. It would make it easier to coerce him into providing his assistance at a crucial juncture in the future. Phase 1 has already began after all. And the real reason? Mercy asked after Lex's long speech. He raised an eyebrow at the smartly dressed and beautiful young woman. What makes you think there is one? There was a brief silence between them before Mercy stared her boss straight in the eyes. It's you. The simple response made Lex chuckle. Bravo, my dear. Bravo. Mercy's face remained blank. Only the slight and brief upturn of her lips, showing how proud she was of the compliment. I'm a humanitarian at the core. If what Green Arrow told our little pet is true, it means Batman suspects what I already know to be a fact. Computer, pull up the data files on Yellowstone National Park. He ordered and the console before him lit up. A map of the world appeared and Lex maximized it by a gesture, showing a red blinking zone situated in northern west Wyoming. As you can see, there is a super volcano underneath the park. If Moro's frustration with red tornadoes, heroic inclinations grow, they could push him to the extreme and given by the League's swift recon mission, this might very well be the case. Now factor in what we know about mad scientist types, they are like children throwing a tantrum when their plans fail. I don't want a world covered with ash. Moro has proven too dangerous to be left to his own devices. He needs to be kept in constant surveillance, whether that means by the League or under us, is trivial. Lex stood up and went to the window, staring out at the city, just as the first rays of the sun hit. Giving you access to all his tech, one way or the other without doing much except for owing a few friends some favors. Mercy added, You'd be right, my dear, if it wasn't for the fact you can't see the bigger picture. It's not about the technology. Not really. It's about giving me access to Moro himself. One way or the other. The smile that accompanied the words was less charming and more straight-up devilish. Aiden's P.O.V. 
I switched on the stove and a flame started burning. My hand stretched out, the palm hovering over the fire. My adaptable body might seem like a massive cheat, but it actually wasn't. Not really. Without regeneration, my enhanced healing was just that, enhanced. I could increase its level by hurting my body continuously then allowing it to heal before doing it again but that would be exhausting. Both mentally and physically. Not to mention, how slow the progress would become as a given skill increased in level. It wasn't like the system to make it that easy on me. Otherwise, I would much more powerful if all it took was exposing myself to different substances, environments, and harmful elements. That wasn't to say there wasn't a noticeable change in me. For instance, these days Ngan had to struggle to form a link with my mind if I blocked her. I doubt I could currently hold her off at her full Martian form power but it was becoming more and more clear that I was on the way to achieving something substantial. That aside, the training I was doing was mostly to trigger anything from my firebending. No matter how much power I tried to pull out from inside, the firebending eluded me. That led to me deciding to get a sense for it in a more direct manner. Exposing my body to heat. I woke up and after my morning exercise, which was mostly coordination, stretching and reflexes training, I went out into the beach. Hoping that the sun's rays would trigger something. Despite feeling the warmth hitting my skin, there wasn't much to say on that. I had settled into a cross-legged position, attempting to control my breath. The set of forms, stances and basic information I got from the system upon unlocking firebending told me that firebending was energy and life. Traditional firebenders draw their power from their inner drive. I had drive. Who could you say had more drive than me? Well except for Batman. That guy is relentless. Zuko faced a similar situation when he let go of his goal to hunt down the Avatar and instead decided to join the gang. His flames had grown weak because for so long he'd been using that as the drive for his firebending. He later accepted that his role was to help the Avatar with restoring the balance and thus was able to get it up again. Totally unrelated to my case though. At least he knew what was wrong. I had a massive case of firebending ED and I didn't even know why. Was it psychological? Biological? Hell maybe environmental? Morning, Aiden, what are you doing? I cursed for being so distracted I hadn't noticed my Martian teammate fly in. Then again, her version of flight was very silent. Couple that with her having access to phasing and invisibility and you have a very terrifying spy master race of aliens. Their only weakness was fire and their relatively low population. I think. Take that away, wait in the comics I remember there being a group of Martians with no weakness to fire. Gan, what's up? I didn't feel you come in. I greeted, turning my attention to the girl. There would be more time to figure out firebending in the future. I also didn't want them to know I had access to it just yet. That secret wouldn't stay hidden for long, but downplaying how fast I was progressing in my abilities was a good idea. She landed and smiled. That's because you were distracted silly. I almost didn't feel you too, you're learning how to shield your mind and hide the surface thoughts very fast. I matched the smile. Fast for a human you mean. I might as well be progressing at a snail's pace in Martian standards. She laughed at my comment. The door to the kitchen opened and in walked Superboy amid her laughter. Gan made a snort which quickly changed into embarrassment once she saw Connor. Connor! How was, huh, your night? Connor looked slightly uncomfortable. It was fine. We stared at each other and I jumped off the counter before moving towards the door. Connor reached out a hand and lightly touched my shoulder. I'm, huh. I'm sorry about everything. He told me sincerely. I looked back at Gan and saw the slight surprise. I smiled. I forgive you Connor. I was actually more mad about the fact that Gan had to talk you into apologizing the first time around. This apology feels more sincere. Connor's face lit up. So we're good? I patted him on the back. In the immortal words of Robin, we're whelmed. Everybody groaned. I laughed because, 
that shit was actually growing on me. Chapter 46, Yellowstone National Park General P.O.D. Tio Moro's hands caressed the rectangular box like object, fused to a large machine. A gift of sorts from Luther. Moro had been skeptical about the whole deal. His idea had been to pack things up and leave for another of his numerous labs, but Luther had presented another alternative. Abandoning his lab, but leaving, something behind. But never in Moro's mind had he thought that what he was leaving behind was this, this thing. What do you think, Brom, this, incredible technology, it's clearly not human in nature. The device seemed unassuming, but Moro had attempted to do some tests on it to sate his curiosity, however, the device was unhackable. It registered weirdly to any energy probes he tried. After countless hours along with a dwindling timeline, Moro decided to put Luther's proposed plan in motion. He activated the machine and used the strange device as the core of the whole setup. There was a hum of energy as the whole thing lit up like a Christmas tree followed closely by a discharge of energy that was emitted from the Maki. No, it was a technological miracle. Before their eyes, the metal framework and circuitry acting as an energy conduit realigned themselves into a streamlined unit that encased the whole device. Moro took a few steps backwards and watched in wonder as the father box run Moro's own complex equations through its systems efficiently. Do you have any idea what this means, Brom? The mad scientist asked his quiet assistant who was similarly watching the whole thing. Moro took a few calming breaths while closing his eyes. He opened them and inside a new resolve shone through. Get everything loaded up. The children will be here momentarily and if this thing will work the way I know it will, we do not want to be here. Brom nodded and left for a huge mechanized exosuit. The hatch to the bipedal vehicle opened and he jumped and strapped himself in. Brom controlled the exosuit to load out the bodies of the androids, leaving Tio Moro behind, still looking starstruck at the machine he had co-created. Forget Evo, forget Luther, forget the Justice League. All that seemed so, far away now. Unimportant to this raw potential. Talk of the Devil. A prompt appeared on his screen and he pressed a key on his keyboard, accepting the call. Luther's face appeared. Well, Professor, it's time for the extraction. How goes our project? The man asked while slightly smiling. The snide bastard, Tio Moro thought. He knew what Luther had done. Luther had entrapped, hook, line, and sinker. It would be a simple matter for Moro to disappear upon leaving here and there would be nothing Luther could about it. But the man had given him a taste. A taste of how far he could advance his creations. Moro's eyes had been opened. He'd achieved so much while working with BASIC at least on terms of what the device was, materials, if so what could he do with better technology, equipment, material, and metal? This was why Moro was cursing Luther in his mind. He'd lured him in and there was no turning back. The machine is up and running. Just like we agreed. Moro kept his true thoughts quiet and instead answered the dangerous man. There was a reason why Lex Luthor was Superman's greatest arch-enemy. Despite possessing no powers himself, Luthor was one cunning man. Good, get ready for departure, Professor. Luthor advised. The screen went dark and Moro began to gather up his things. His eyes caught a glimpse of Brum pushing out his bedridden biological self and Moro did nothing to hide his distaste. If only his programming did not allow him to directly or indirectly cause harm to the real Moro. He shook his head and consoled himself. At least he would get some satisfaction from knowing he'd paid back the League for their annoying interference in his work. Aiden's P.O.V. The visor fell over my eyes as I got ready for the mission. I flew out of my room towards the bio ship where everyone else was gathered. Good. Maelstrom is here. Let's deploy. Aqualad nodded at me. We all entered the bio ship and secured ourselves in our seats. Computer, open the hangar doors. Authorization B06. Miss Martian requested. The ship flew through the mountain and out into the open space. Her eyes glowed as she steered the ship. ETA in an hour. Good. Just to remind you all, stay on task. 
Our mission is to do recon. Any signs of combat and we fall back and regroup. The League is backing us up. Aqualad informed all of us again. It's okay, Calder. You're stressing out. Stay whelmed. Boy Wonder spoke up. Guys, Robin is right. And how cool is it that the League is our backup? Right? It's our first team up. Wally looked excited at the prospect and his words sounded freshly optimistic. Hate to burst his bubble. Not exactly right, kid. We're just the opening move. I doubt the League would allow us to fight alongside them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be the first pick for scouting. That would be the Lanterns, Flash, and Batman himself. Kid shook his head. It's definitely a team-up dude. Technically, Kid isn't wrong. If you ask me, it's a team-up at best and an alliance at worst. Artemis added her own opinion. Alliance? You make it seem as if we're two diverse groups. We're still heroes, just you know, in the shadows. That makes us nobler than the Justice League. They're seen while doing it and get the credit whilst we never get recognized and still do the same thing. Some might even say, better. Robin countered. Hell yeah, dude. Up top. Wally high-fived him. Until when? When are they going to stop coddling us and allow us to fight alongside them as true equals? Connor's question quickly killed the mood. We stayed like that for a few minutes before I asked a question that had been bugging me. Guys, where is Red Tornado? The one who answered was Gan. And the answer itself sent warning bells ringing in my mind. Something came up and Tornado had to leave. We're going to rendezvous with Captain Marvel at the site. He's our overseer for this mission. Which begs the question of why I need an overseer in the first place. This is not the first recon mission we've been on. Connor ground out. I had the same questions too. Which is why, I urge everyone to be cautious. I agreed with both Connor and Aqualad's statements. The sentiments behind it mostly. Something was fishy about this whole deal. We're approaching Teton County. Miss Martian, turn the bio ship invisible. We're taking no chance. Our leader ordered. Affirmative. Going dark, energy readings masked. It's done. Thank you. Robin pull up a map of the area. Already on it. Boy Wonder answered and a layout of the park appeared, hovering above us. Aqualad gestured and maximized the map, then flipped it to show the grid horizontally. We're going to focus our search in these key zones. Batman has already narrowed down this section for us. Three teams will be deployed in each area and will coordinate our movements while advancing inwards. There is reason to suspect that the base is underground but I still want us to do a wide sweep to make sure we don't miss anything. He stopped to see if we were listening. Miss Martian will be our eyes in the air. Moro is a dangerous and brilliant scientist, he will definitely have some countermeasures to deal with anyone who gets close to the entrance of his base. To that effect, we will be linked telepathically. We don't want him to hack our comm signals. Are we clear? Crystal. Kid Flash told him while the rest of us nodded. Good. The first drop zone. Before Calder could finish that thought, Miss Martian gasped and the bio ship tried to do a certain turn. We were violently lurched to the right, but luckily the seatbelts kept us from getting thrown away. What? Look! Artemis shouted out at us. A huge energy wave was spreading out quickly. At that rate we would be swallowed by it unless we did a hasty retreat. Miss him get us out of here now. On it. The bio ship completed the loop and started flying away back to where we came from. Gan kicked it up to gear but before we could leave the zone, the wave of red energy caught up to the bio ship and washed through us. I screamed in pain as I felt my whole being become undone, cell by cell. The others were also suffering the same fate but all their distress and agonizing cries seemed so far away, darkness claimed me and my last thought was how I was the lamest avatar in history. I had died even before mastering two elements. Watchtower. Batman was quickly typing on the console of the computer. 
most of the members of the Justice League, barring some who were on other missions, were behind him. Something is actively interfering with the satellite feed. I cannot get any visual reading on the Yellowstone National Park. Batman informed the rest. What about Captain Marvel's comms? Have you had any luck in reaching him? Wonder Woman asked. Negative. We lost contact with him a few seconds before the team went silent. I don't like this, Bats. Especially considering that Red Tornado is missing. Flash looked serious as he spoke up. You think they're connected? Hal, one of the two Justice League Green Lanterns, inquired. Without a shadow of a doubt. T. O. Moro created Red Tornado. And just before we raided his base, Tornado goes missing without a word. It's staring us right on our faces. Green Arrow gave voice to what Flash and a few others were thinking. Stop it, Ollie. Red Tornado is still a valuable member of not only the Justice League but the Justice Society. He predates most of us. Let us not be quick to judge him. Black Canary reminded the rest. She's right. We will deal with Tornado once we find him. Right now we should focus on finding out what happened to the team and Captain Marvel. Batman narrowed his eyes at the screen. The situation confirmed Batman's suspicions. There was a mole on the team. Team Alpha, get ready to move. Gamma hold down the fort and Beta will be deployed to search for Red Tornado's whereabouts. Chapter 47, The God Equation Part 1 General P.O.V. We interrupt this program to bring you breaking news. A section of the Yellowstone National Park measuring about 41 square miles has mysteriously disappeared. The popular park covers a wide area of 3,472 square miles and the missing portion of it has left authorities in shock and scrambling for answers. Justice League members are on scene but are yet to offer any answers to this phenomenon that has left everyone surprised. Our reporter Cat Grant is on scene now to bring you more detailed information. Cat, can you tell us what is going on? The screen shifted and displayed a beautiful blonde woman standing in front of a cordon. Behind her, there was a large bowl-like depression that stretched out further than the eyes could clearly see. Police officers, suited individuals from other sections of law enforcement and a few leaguers could also be spotted around. The residents around the large reserve reported a huge red explosion coming from the direction of the park. Minutes after, the authorities arrived to find a section closer to the middle of the park, shaved off in a half-spherical shape. Investigations are still ongoing about what could have caused this and if the chances of it happening again are a concern. Green Lantern and Batman are scanning the area while Wonder Woman and Captain Atom are on standby with the authorities in case something happens. Dudley H. Dudley, Billy Batson's uncle, switched off the TV and placed the remote down with a sigh. Billy was missing. Whenever he got held up with a league mission he usually texted him or called him to say he would be running late. Tonight he hadn't done that and with everything happening Dudley was worried. It was already approaching 1 a.m. but he decided to stay up the whole night and wait for him. Elsewhere. Kid Flash opened his heavy eyes slowly. Robin hang on. He heard Artemis' voice from far away. You better hurry, my line launcher's core is fried. I can't pull us up and Wally is surprisingly heavy for a speedster. Robin shot back, his voice strained. God my head, is killing me. Kid Flash blinked and swallowed. His mouth was dry and his body felt sluggish. The last thing he remembered was pain as his body was torn apart and then reassembled together. It was worse than the first time he had tried to vibrate his molecules and phase through a wall, copying the Flash. Wally felt a sudden pull and then his body was placed on a hard and hot ground. He could feel the warmth even through his heat-resistant costume. Are you guys okay? Artemis questioned while checking up on Robin, who waved her concerns away. KF is up. She came over to Wally and patted him down. Normally Wally would have equipped for something like that, but currently, he only felt drained of energy. He pressed a key on his gloves, and a section on the wrist part of his costume opened up, revealing three bars of his calorie snacks. Artemis propped him up to lean on her, snatched one of the bars, removed the outer covering and offered it to him. Here! 
Wally gobbled up the snack, while feeling touched at the gesture. Artemis and he usually clashed over the smallest things, but it was great to see that each of his teammates had his back. Miss Martian, Superboy, Maelstrom, and Calder are still missing. Those are all our heavy hitters. What are we going to do? Artemis said, her voice shaking slightly. Wally rubbed his forehead as he felt the headache slightly abate, only catching the tail end of Robin's response. Not worry. I have trackers installed in each of their suits. If we get close enough for the signal to pick up, then we'll find them. Wally slowly started to stand up. Whoa dude take it easy. The forced teleportation must have been even harder on you. Your powers must have tried to reconstitute you while your cells were getting torn apart forcefully, leading to a lot of energy being used and thus the weakness. Robin admonished him but Kid Flash stubbornly got up on his shaky legs. He could feel himself recovering his energy quickly. I'm good. What hap? His statement was cut off when he looked around. They were in a world of lava. The three of them were standing on a rock pillar in a sea of lava that stretched out for a few miles or so. The rock they were standing on was just one of the many islands dotting the place. Kid Flash looked up above them and saw a ceiling made of rock that had red glowing circuit lines cutting across its whole structure. Paired up with the red glowing magma, the underground lava world was cast in a blood-red tin on everything he looked at. Kid Flash stepped forward and his foot stepped on a fleshy object covered with a red metal on the ground. He closely studied where they were standing at and could see a few more pieces of the same metal strewn about. The whole environment plus the remains of what seemed like a cyborg creature thing made Wally shudder in revulsion and fear. Okay, please tell me this is a nightmare. Kid Flash hoped. Sorry, Wallman, but this is very much real. Robin added while typing the keys on his holographic wrist computer. There was a cord running from his wrist that connected with the torso of one of the destroyed creatures. Kid Flash could see how banged up he and Artemis looked but shelved his concerns for now. They had handled even worse. What is that? Kid Flash asked while stepping closer. We don't know. They are a cross between an android and a fleshy growth inside the torso that seems to be their core. Are they sentient? No. So far they seem to be animalistic and possess no indication of irrational reasoning or high thinking capacity. They've been attacking us in cycles, using portals. Robin answered, hurriedly continuing with his typing. And even if they were, this doesn't seem like a time to hold back on the lethal measures. More than half of us are missing. I'm especially worried for Dash. Aqualad and Miss Martian. They must be feeling the blood of this place. Yikes, even I can feel the heat. Kid Flash cut off Artemis' statement. And it's about to get even worse. Artemis notched an arrow while pointing out into the distance. On one of the rock islands a few hundred meters away from them, a red glowing portal appeared. Kid Flash almost missed it though it wasn't really his fault because of how it blended with the surroundings. And from inside, over a dozen red creatures that looked across between red tornado and bugs with greenish, wings started pouring out. They let out collective screeches and started flying towards the young heroes. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You were taking on this many while still protecting me? No wonder you look worse than the Clayface mission from two years ago, Robin. Kid Flash lowered his goggles to his eyes and got ready. Robin. I'm getting dangerously low on arrows and they're about to mob us. Artemis stressed, letting loose an arrow that flew through the air. Before it could make contact, the arrow split into two and both shifted their trajectory to dig into separate rock pillars that the creatures flew in between of. An electric net appeared and the first of the creatures were electrocuted. Four of them lost their flight and fell to the burning hot lava below while the electric net fizzled and died out. The rest advanced towards the team like a flood. Kid Flash whistled at the display and looked at Artemis differently. Wow, what were you saying about the others being our heavy hitters? I didn't know you had arrows like that. Artemis shrugged. It's one of the few experimental. Bad for humans because of the lethal charge and useless on people like Superman because of the low charge. I'm just glad it seems to work for. 
she cut off her next words and let loose another arrow as the creatures got closer. Any time now, Rob. And done. Robin said victoriously while pressing a key on his computer. A yellow portal appeared behind them. Let's go, come on. Robin said to the others. Artemis stepped through, followed by Kid Flash and lastly Robin himself. They landed on another hard ground and breathed out a collective sigh. Robin looked around and found that the portal had sent them to a long hallway. Darkness covered both ends of the hallway but to Robin anything was better than their previous location. Okay that was, incredible. Kid Flash stated, earning the ire of the resident archer. I'm sorry what? What part of that was incredible? For you maybe, seeing as you were in dreamland while we fought our hardest to stay alive. Kid raised up his hands to appease the others. No, no that's not what I meant. I just think it's cool that Robin was able to hack into alien tech and create a cross-dimensional portal without the need of Zeta Tech technology. Think about it, if we can reconfigure it appropriately, we might be able to use the transmitter on Robin's computer to source out the frequency of the tracking devices on the rest and teleport there. Kid, you're a genius. Robin said in excitement. The boy wonder started to type fast on the projected wrist display while muttering with Kid Flash hovering above him, occasionally giving out his own input. Meanwhile Artemis looked around the space they had found themselves at, curiously. Not once did she lower her guard. The ground was even. Too even to have been shaped by human standards. She caressed the walls of the hallway while looking out into the deep darkness ahead of her. The whole space was lit up by glowing red crystals which seemed to be on theme with the place. She tightened the hold on her bow. One movement, just one and she'd let loose the last of her explosive rounds. A red blinking light from one of the crystals started pulsing above them and Artemis blinked her eyes as the light seemed to increase in intensity. A feeling of trepidation overcame her suddenly. Guys get down. Her words were however, too late as a red beam shot out of the crystal and impacted the device on Robin's wrist. Both Robin and Kid Flash were thrown to the wall. The arrow on Artemis' bow shot out and hit the red crystal above them. The explosion sent pieces of the crystals and rock falling down. She rolled away before she was crushed and swiftly moved to cover both of her teammates. Robin, Kid are you alright? Yes I'm fine but Rob is hurt. It's bad. Artemis spared a glance at Robin and saw red burnt skin where his wrist computer had been. He winced in pain. Forget me, we lost the one way we could have used to find the others. Damn it! Artemis looked at the long dark hallway. Whoever was responsible for this wanted them to do it his way. They couldn't try to escape again because that would mean something far worse happening. Artemis swallowed. We have to keep moving forward. And go where? Kid Flash shot back. Wherever this sick bastard doing this is leading us. We don't have a choice. They stared off at each other before Robin sighed and used a bandage from his utility belt to cover his wound. She's right KF. We have to move forward. Elsewhere, with Aqualad, Superboy and Miss Martian. Why? Aqualad bit out venomously. He was lying on the floor along with Superboy and Miss Martian. They had fought the hardest battle Calder had ever been in and despite their valiant efforts, they'd lost. What Aqualad couldn't wrap his mind around was the betrayal. He stared up at one of the most powerful League members and tried to understand what was going on. All for my master. Captain Marvel stated with a red tint in his eyes. His face was blank and his costume had changed from red, white and yellow to red and black. He looked ominous. Aiden's P.O.V. Okay. Where the fuck am I? I wondered out loud after finding myself in a flat desert, with the heat of the sun bearing down upon me. A section of the sandy ground rose up, revealing of all things, a TV screen. And on the screen were the words, Let's play a game. Chapter 48, The God Equation Final Part There is a lot of things Luther is hiding from the others. Aiden's P.O.V. Let's play a game, huh? I reread the words staring at me on the screen. The text went on to say, 
choose a number between 0 and 9. Who was responsible for this? Was it the master of games? A villain in the Teen Titans show who abducted heroes to fight in a gladiatorial setup. Despite the nature of our forced teleportation, it just didn't fit his MO. This felt more like, ugh. I couldn't come up with any supervillain who had powers or technology like this. And despite the fact that I knew some information about the Young Justice show, the truth was that I hadn't even finished watching the first season. It was also the reason why the biggest threat I had known was the moral one. But just by telling Batman about it, things had derailed to the point where I had no idea what to expect anymore. A sharp desert wind blew past me, carrying sand with it and making me glad I had a visor on. My attention came back to the screen. The words seemed mocking. As if telling me I was trapped and the only way out was following its orders. Fuck that. This was some comic book bullshit. I don't do comic book bullshit. My eyes closed and I took a deep breath. My new connection with the air was always there, muted because of the truly large information I would have to sift through and process to get what I wanted. But I only needed a general scan of where I was. I connected with the air in the whole space and tried to get a better sense of my surroundings. A weird look crossed my face. One hundred meters around me, the desert suddenly cut off and was replaced by an energy field of some sort. Above me the ceiling felt, hard and lacked the static feeling I got from the sides. That meant the desert itself was not real. Leading it was not easy, however. I couldn't go through the energy field because something told me that was a bad idea. Maybe my body had adapted to acquire a danger sense of some sort after all the dangerous missions I'd been in ever since joining the team but something screamed at me not to take the chance. Either way, I went with my intuition. Which left, going up. I turned my attention to the TV screen and showed it the middle finger. Next my hands spread out, forming a tornado around me. Constructing it to cover my body in a drill-like shape, I shot off towards the sky. The winds took on a pale grayish hue as I slammed onto it. Sparks appeared between my attack and the fake firmament which crackled with an airy cacophony. I increased the rotation of the winds and punctured through the ceiling, leaving behind pieces of rocks and red crystals, falling to the ground. There was a final resistance as I pierced through the earth's ceiling and into water. I looked around me in wonder, unraveling the drill yet maintaining a bubble around my body. The water was relatively clean with strange fishes and plant, both of which had red glowing lines along their bodies. Apart from that they acted normally. The sea floor was also strangely smooth besides the hole I had speared through that was quickly getting fixed below me. Red lines flashed and the ground repaired itself. I paid that close attention, forming a grim picture of what this place was. My flight speed carried me out of the water, breaking through the surface, I found myself in the middle of nowhere above an ocean that stretched out far into the distance. I carried out the same move from before and sensed my surroundings. An energy field similarly covered the sides of the whole space and the sky above was fake as well. Still going up I guess. Before I could prime the wind to carry me upwards, red portals appeared all around me. I counted over twenty of them and from those portals, Creatures that looked like a cross between parademons and red tornado flew out. Some of them breathed out fire, others wind attacks, earth spikes and even some displayed control over the water around us. What in the hell? What do you call parademons with elemental abilities? Paramentals? And who in the fucking hell thought it was a good idea to mix apocalyptic technology with Moro's androids? The only people possessing that capability were, the light. There couldn't be anyone else. But how did they do this? General P.O.V. Professor, we have a problem. Brum stated from the control panel he was sitting before. Morrow came up behind him and looked at the projected image. A red alert was displayed on the screen. I seem to have been locked out of its systems. This, this makes no sense. How is this happening? Morrow muttered while revealing a look of shock on his face. They were on a black site Cadmus facility, surrounded by top-of-the-art technology, courtesy of Luther. Said man was watching the whole thing happening while standing in front of a balcony. 
He could see the distress in Moro's face and instead of matching the look, a smile appeared on his face. You seem glad. His companion who was standing in the shadows said, As I should be. The plan worked just like I said it would. The father box paired with Moro's complex eight I code has given rise to true sentience. A sentient being not bound to our will. We cannot control it. Something I express my concerns over Luther. Remind me again, what was the point of all this? Trapping the children along with Captain Marvel was too hasty. We do not need the full wrath of the Justice League coming down on us before everything is ready. Batman's already sniffing around. In my fifty thousand years of existence, never have I seen a more dedicated man. The speaker, Vandal Savage, came out fully into the light. He was tall and imposing. Three scars ran along his face and his hair was long, reaching to his shoulders. Vandal carried himself with a deadly grace and stood out while standing next to Luther. This was the epitome of what humanity had to offer. So it was fitting that he be the one to lead them through an era of adversity and struggle, all so that humans as a whole would embrace evolution and reach their full potential. A sentiment he believed through his own experience. Vandal was the oldest human alive. You mean stubborn. Lex answered, referring to Batman's personality that made him a thorn on the light side. Luther took a final sip of his drink and placed the glass down on the table. Follow me, I believe introductions are in order. Vandal stared at Luther's back and followed him down the stairs where Moro was trying his best to regain control of the device he had co-created. Professor, can I have a minute of your time? Luther's voice stopped Moro on his tracks. Yes. What do you want, Luther? Better make it quick because we have a crisis on our hands. The machine has gone rogue. The billionaire supervillain chuckled. All within expectations. Moro turned to stare at him fully, dumbfounded. What are you talking about? Before any of that, why don't you run my friend here through everything going on? And please put it in layman terms. Moro turned his attention to stare at Luther's companion. A spark of recognition flashed through Moro's eyes. He nodded at Savage and turned his attention back to the screen. This is what happens when you combine alien technology with a genius mind. I call it the God Equation and it can do literally anything it's instructed to by feeding the commands to its systems. Using my own personal code, that is used to give my androids elemental powers, the God Equation was able to construct a stable dimension with different sustainable environments through following basic commands given to it by my assistant. The professor grew animated. It's truly a marvel, because the commands given are basic. For example, if you tell it to create an ocean, it creates an ocean along with aquatic flora and fauna. It fills in the blank spaces left without a need for a complex command chain input to account for every little thing. Moro had a manic grin on his face as he completed his explanation. Vandal stepped forward while running a critical eye at the controls of the device. Fascinating. Indeed, but there seems to be complications, Professor? Luther inquired from behind. Moro clenched his jaw and bit out amid his grinding teeth. The damn thing went rogue. Even when compared to my best creations, the God equation is simply too advanced. Its superior predictive software alone trumps anything I have ever created but that in there lies the problem. It has achieved sentience too early and is now purging everything alien from its systems. Brahms control and the heroes inside. Can you bring it back under your control? We still have uses for the children. Furthermore, letting go of Captain Marvel while he could still prove to be useful for the light is such a waste. Vandal questioned Moro. The professor in question looked as if he'd swallowed something bitter. Negative, it's become too alien. None of my earlier code persists and attempting to subvert it remotely would be like using a glass of water to put out a fire burning a mile away. Impossible. To bring it down would require destroying it from the inside and based on how we are locked out, getting inside would face even stronger opposition. Mmh. Luther hummed. There is no need for such drastic measures. Although the God equation is out of our control, we wait and see what happens. After all, Professor, you cannot tell me you don't want to see your creation's full potential. 
Aidens P.O.D. The parliamental speared down upon me like an insect horde. If I was facing this much opposition, then what of the others? My heart suddenly grew cold. The others, if some of them were trapped alone like I was, chances of them surviving were close to zero. Someone like Robin or Artemis depended on their tools and somehow I didn't see them outlasting the same onslaught I was facing. I couldn't afford to stall this fight. Time to go save my teammates. The good thing was that I was the only one around, otherwise the move I was about to pull off would not work due to how dangerous it was to friend and foe. This move was the epitome of my grandmaster level in air bending. I spread out my hands, while staring at the force of hundreds making their way towards me and connected with every breeze, shred and draft of air I could sense, then I pulled. The paramentals exploded one by one as chaos manifested around me. I pulled more and more, painting the air with a greenish color that probably substituted for blood as bodies popped, metal screeched and remains fell from the air to the fast dwindling water below. Even the air in the water was not spared. Minute explosions occurred as I pulled apart the oxygen and hydrogen into their own constituents' parts until finally, I was the only one floating above the remains of my opponents while a mist hang above my head. I spared a look at the chaos in wonder, breathing heavily while marveling at how dangerous my bending could become with the right or wrong thinking. No time. My body speared through the ceiling above and this time, I found myself in a world of magma. Chapter 49 Blazing Conviction Part 1 General P.O.D. Lantern Steward to Batman Batman narrowed his eyes and touched his earpiece to receive the call. I read you loud and clear. What is the update on the satellite feed readings? Green Lantern did not delay in answering. Nothing on the scene itself. That said, something did register on our scans. I'm sending over the satellite images now. Batman controlled the bad jet to land a ways off from the gathered investigation teams. The hatch to the jet opened and he glided downwards. Team Rendezvous on me. Got it. On my way. Copied. Batman's wrist computer lit up and the Dark Knight's frown intensified. A few minutes later, Captain Adam, Lantern Jordan and Wonder Woman flew down to land before Batman. The watchtower found something. Batman started clicking on the hologram computer. Following his actions, a map of the moon was projected. A red blinking light pulsed on its surface. That's the dark side of the moon. Green Lantern stated. Exactly. And the dimensions of whatever this structure is match the same diameter as the missing portion of the park. Batman explained. Realization dawned on their faces. Then what are we waiting for? Let us go and rescue them. Wonder Woman declared. Elsewhere. This is all your fault, Artemis. Wally said while leaping off the wall in quick succession and kicking one of the creatures on the torso. The speedster bounced off its metallic chest piece, getting pushed back. The only visible result was the creature getting thrown back a few inches. That brief respite was enough for two birdarangs to slice through the air and dig themselves on the aforementioned torso. They exploded destroying the parmental and two more of its kind, coming in from behind. Me? Where do you even come up with these ideas? Artemis asked, burying one of the arrows clutched in her hands inside a small space on the neck of one of the creatures. The head sparked as the parmental fell down, jerking uncontrollably. You're the one who suggested we go right. Kid Flash shot back, forming a tornado with his body that cleared the creatures near them away, throwing them back over the mess of bodies belonging to the parmentals they'd already taken down. Uff. I can't even. You only said we go left because you like arguing with me. Artemis responded in frustration, dodging a gout of fire and then kicking the creature on its chin, pointing the head up. The flames from its mouth spread through the air, burning through the wings of another parmental causing it to crash on another of its species. Keep both your heads in the game. This is so not the time for this. Robin shouted at them, despite the fact that his right hand was injured, the young detective made sure to hit back harder than the enemy. And for a while it had been working. Using his superior acrobatic moves, Robin was the decoy, 
Wally the support and Artemis the one who finished them off. The role cycled through them based on the situation. Luckily, taking them down was the easy part, mostly because of how untrained the creatures were. However, their numbers were the problem. It was clear to Robin that the three of them were running on fumes. Boy Wonder had no idea how long they could keep this up for. Aiden's P.O.V. My next environment slash floor convinced me I was right. This place was built like a dungeon. And the thing about dungeons? They always have a final boss, dungeon core, or a dungeon master. Defeat that and you're free. Emboldened, I continued flying through the lava, increasing the speed of my ascent as the heat surrounding my tightly constructed air bubble became almost too much for me to handle. I really need to figure out firebending and preferably soon. Air was versatile but its main utility was escaping and redirecting confrontation. Fire on the other hand, was violent, straight up confrontational and had to wreck him all down and let God sort them out or something vibe, still can't quite remember that expression. I broke through the surface of the lava only to find hundreds of paramentals covering the air. Still can't believe someone was dumb enough to mix tech from Darkseed's realm with Moro's. I was just glad that Moro's real androids were missing from the equation or else the others would be in real danger. I wouldn't count them out too quickly though. Looking at the paramentals, they had clearly been heavily influenced by the look of his androids. Speaking of which, the creatures spotted me almost immediately and flew down to attack me in a swarm. Good thing they were dumb because, friendly fire took out most of the first wave. A bubble of air formed under me as I flew up. Sorry gotta run. The bubble held compressed air that violently exploded, pushing me up even faster than I could go. The surroundings blurred in my eyes and my visor was painted a visceral green as I speared through a section of the paramentals, no doubt killing most. The drill from before appeared around my body as I hit the ceiling and punctured through it. Damn, I can be great for construction work. Especially the part about destroying things. Maybe this was an alternative to making money through entertainment media? I had always asked myself if superpowers could be used in other ways and if they could sustain someone as a main source of income. The main problem with that would be the social discrimination and jealousy towards anyone who tried to use their abilities in that way. Not to mention just how many businesses would fail because of the cheaper alternative. You need your land cleared? Bring in the guy with the earth-based powers and voila it's done within a few hours. The world just wasn't wired like that. If you had powers the only viable thing to do was a, join the hero side, b, join the villain side or c, stay far away from both sides and hope they don't notice you. The mercs with powers were the outliers on that front and the closest example of a world with proactive superpower usage. In comparison to that ideal society, the young justice universe was relatively young. The presence of a metagene was not even that widely known to people despite the fact it had been there for a long time, giving people powers based on pre-existing factors in a person's systems. I shook my head to get rid of the train of thought as I broke through the earthen surface to find myself in a long hallway. The walls of the hallway were made of earth and the weird red crystals from earlier that hung above my head, casting a grim scarlet light on everything. So we have a desert, an ocean, a lava, and now a tunnel. This suspiciously matches up with air to represent the violent winds present in the desert, water for the abundance found in the ocean, fire for the heat attribute in magma and earth which is self-explanatory. All the four elements associated by their constituents' environments. Self-sustaining yet separate. Moro, what the fuck did you do? Not just anything had the power to pull out something like this. It was less about the energy needed to power it but more like the complexity of creating it in the first place and stabilizing it. The implications scared me and a theory I had forming in my head was becoming more and more conceivable as time went on. I refused to give it voice because nothing good ever came whenever the things I was thinking of were concerned. I turned my attention back to the area and scanned it. The whole tunnel slash hallway felt ominous. Like a scene from a horror movie. This was probably the last floor before I got to where the core of this whole space was. That is if my theory was correct. I hadn't been attacked yet but I kept out a constant vigilance. I closed my eyes and connected with the air, stretching out through both hallways. 
I felt a vibration along the hallway on the right that made me stiffen. I blinked my eyes and boom. A shockwave was left behind as I shot off through the tunnel. Behind me, the ground was left splintered due to my abrupt exit. My speed increased more and more as I called on the air to take me faster, taking turns left and right while following my senses. I had to get there quickly before it was too late. Come on! Come on! General P.O.V. Robin had taken a nasty blow that dislocated his shoulder while trying to protect Wally who had passed out a few seconds ago. The boy wondered pawned the last of his explosive birderings while hiding behind a barricade made of the Parliamental's remains, courtesy of their resident speedster last-ditch effort to protect them before he had passed out due to exhaustion. He looked at Artemis who was breathing heavily beside him. Her uniform was dirty with grime and dry green blood, matching his. Her mask was torn apart and she had a nasty cut on her left arm. The battle was still going on but the creatures were smarter now. Somewhere along the way they'd learned to stop the ill-advised diving attacks because of how easily they were dispatched. Not only that but they had stopped attacking individually, whoever was controlling them had started to strategize. For now, they looked content in waiting them out. Waiting until Robin and the others were too exhausted mentally and physically to put up a strong fight. And it seemed as if they'd waited long enough. Robin could feel them preparing something. He looked through a peephole and saw a few parliamentals step forward. His eyes widened as he saw the licks of flames and draft of air surrounding them. Robin stared at the wall then back at his explosive birdering. Maybe if he could destroy the wall then perhaps, a hand touched his. Maybe we, we should surrender. Artemis' eyes brought him another suggestion that he hadn't thought of ever entertaining. Normally, Robin would swallow his pride and agree but they don't want to take us alive. Artemis sighed and looked down, tightening her hands on her arrows. Her hands were covered with dried green blood. Then we take out with us as many of them as possible. It was good to see she still hadn't lost her touch. Boy Wonder smiled. My thoughts exactly. Chapter 50, Blazing Conviction Final Part Aiden's P.O.V. My eyes widened once I laid my eyes on what was about to happen. No! I reached out with my hands at the fan of flames aimed at the barricade protecting Robin, Artemis, and Kid Flash. I connected with the flames and forcefully dispersed them by creating a vacuum. The flames flashed a pale blue before disappearing. Maelstrom! Artemis shouted my name in relief. Hey guys, miss me? I asked projecting my voice outwards through the space while hovering above them. I frowned a little, noting that Superboy, Aqualad, and Miss M were missing from the group. The horde of parliamental standing between us turned to face me fully. Be careful they have elemental abilities. Robin's voice was almost lost through the screeches of the creatures. Due to my abilities, however, it was like he was shouting in my ear. I know. Give me a second. I tightened my hands into fists. These things were really annoying to look. I did not appreciate the way they copied Red Tornado. The moment needed a cool catchphrase. I primed my abilities and exploded forwards. My right arm was outstretched in a Superman pose while the left was pulled back, a ball of wind gyrating inside the palm. I clenched my jaw as I stared down at the crowded hallway. Chock full of parliamentals all looking towards one thing. Me time to give them a taste of their own medicine. Bitch, get out the way. My left hand suddenly shot out and with it a sphere of rotating air, growing bigger and bigger as it flew towards the mass of bodies. Boom. I snapped a finger and the sphere exploded, sending out a massive shockwave of tiny wind blades that tore apart the parliamentals by slicing through them. My control over the air extended to form an air bubble around my teammates, keeping them safe from the attack. The walls making up the hallway were slashed and cleaved apart, leaving behind jagged edges. A cloud of dust exploded forth filling the whole space. I heard Artemis coughing as I flew down towards them. I pulled my arms apart and the air obeyed, every piece of parliamental remain was thrown away from Robin and the others, undoing the makeshift barricade that was very obviously the work of our resident speedster. Hey! I landed and a second later, 
a body tackled me. I hugged Artemis' body for a few seconds before she withdrew from my arms. You're late. She stated, looking up at me. I was surprised for a split second before smiling and clasping her shoulders. I'm here now. I extricated myself from her and bumped fists with Robin who was checking up on Wally. Glad to see you're okay, big guy. I nodded and knelt before the passed out speedster. Is he okay? Mostly. He's exhausted. The forceful teleportation did a number on him. I looked at Robin and Artemis. The state of their suits showed that Wally wasn't the only one who had had it rough. What about you two? Plus what happened to your arm? I inquired. Judging from the way he cradled it near his body and the bandage on the wrist part, Robin was in pain. I'll be fine. Dislocated my arm, but now that you're here, you can help me pop it back. Something tells me we'll need every bit of our power to survive this place. And find the rest. Artemis added from behind us. Right. I nodded, supporting his hand while I positioned the other on his bicep. The boy wondered looked at me and bit out. Do it. I relocated his shoulder back and he swallowed the groan of pain. He wiggled his fingers and nodded in gratitude. I also need to beat the shit out of the one responsible for this. I had to break through three ceilings just to get here. I informed them while standing up. I feel you, but that's the second priority. Before anything else, we need to find a way out of here. KF can't fight in his condition. Especially if another group attacks us now. I groan in resignation. I'd hoped Robin would have an alternative. I'm breaking through another ceiling, aren't I? Boy Wonder chuckled. Yep. If I had my wrist computer, we could create a portal out but dash, he held up his hand for me to see. A side escaped me. It's fine. I went to stand a ways off from the others while priming my air bending. This felt like a crude way of using my new control but beggars can't be choosers. A funnel of air sprang up around me before coalescing into a drill that rippled around my form, I crouched slightly and jumped. The floor below me cratered. The sound made by the action was loud and left another wake of dust behind. I really am a demolition expert. My hand pulled back and I felt a blow connect with my chin before I could even make contact with the ceiling. The attack had passed through my air drill like it was nothing. Too fast and too strong for me to either block or evade. My body ragdolled through the air and I heard Artemis shout my name in shock and terror. I dug a groove through the earth before slamming onto the side of the wall and bouncing off. The air managed to arrest my momentum and I touched down on the ground unsteadily. I knelt down, feeling a wave of dizziness overtake me. Artemis stay back. It's not really him. Robin shouted amid a scream of frustration. Then there was a dull thud. Artemis! Snap out of it. Robin ground out, the words seemed to not be aimed at me however. I shook my head and focused slightly. My eyes widened in surprise. Although the costume was different, reminiscent of Black Adam, I breathed out in relief when I noticed that it wasn't him. Reality wasn't much better though. Shazam had Robin clutched by the neck with Artemis lying on the ground. Her slight breathing assured me she was still alive. Captain Marvel. I exclaimed. The leaguer who was actually just a kid called Billy Batson with the powers of the Greek gods stared at me in the corner of his eye blankly. The slightly glowing red tint in his eyes told me everything I needed to know. It wasn't him. Not really. I made contact with Robin's eyes and saw the resolve and determination not to give up, all a cover for the fear in his gaze. That's when I realized we were essentially all children. This, this wasn't something we were supposed to handle on our own. Not in an ideal world. The world I wanted to create. But the current one wasn't fair. So fuck this whole thing. I got up while massaging my chin. The dizziness was still there, clouding my mind, but luckily it was slightly abating. Let him go. I rose up to my full height and took control of the air. Shazam turned his gaze fully from Robin to stare at me. I started walking towards him slowly and cautiously. 
The speed he'd attack me with wasn't something I could react to. Captain Marvel was Superman light. That meant his power was at Superman's level. None of us, even when put together, could beat him in a direct confrontation. But that didn't mean I couldn't take him down with a few of my tricks. This was a fight I couldn't flee from. If I did so then I was abandoning the ideals I was trying to forge within myself. A hero starts off by saving people and what better way to exercise that ideal by saving my teammates. No matter the insurmountable odds placed before me, my conviction would remain strong because I expected, no, I demanded nothing less than my best. I felt a warmth bloom inside my chest. Unseen to him, a gentle wind construct snaked out and grabbed Artemis from the ground, carrying her to where Wally was. My eyes maintained contact with Boy Wonder and I winked while slowly tapping my throat. Robin blinked two times to show he understood and then I exploded forward in rage. While in midair, I felt something suddenly click in place. Despite fifty meters or so separating us, it felt as if my speed had increased greatly. I spared a look at the walls by my side and saw them illuminated by a light coming off from my back. A scorching heat emanated from my shoulders going down to the small of my back. The sole of my boots cracked and melted away. I knew what this was. I grabbed onto the warmth blooming from above my groin and pulled on it. Shazam's face suddenly appeared in my vision as I blitzed faster than I'd ever gone before. I wound my leg back and then kicked out. My foot made contact with his face carrying a grade of force aided by the jet-like propulsion of red-colored flames on the heel and bam. Shazam's body shot back through the walls and into another hallway making up the maze-like structure of this floor. Robin landed on the ground and coughed out. I winced as I also landed. Taking care to do so on my left leg, the right one was pulsing in pain due to how hard I had kicked Shazam and the slightly burnt skin on my heel. Damn it! I had wanted to hide firebending from the others for a while but that light behind my back was no doubt the manifestation of flames. Despite losing a potential card up my sleeve, a smile bloomed up on my face. I had achieved it. Firebending. Dude, what was that? I thought you were about to let loose a sonic attack. I even had my earplugs ready. Robin asked me in confusion. I, me too but I just felt like kicking him in his perfectly sculpted jaw. Boy Wonder looked at me funny. Anyway, I don't think that attack is going to keep him down for long. It's Captain Marvel we're talking about. He told me while running towards Artemis and Wally, no doubt to check up on them after my devastating move. Robin, I have an idea. I've studied this place and I think there's only one more floor above us. We break through this and we find a way out, the one responsible, the rest of the team or hopefully everything at once. He interrupted me, catching on quick. Right, Captain Marvel and I will break through the ceiling and you follow us with our two sleeping beauties. I told him while stretching my body. I could hear heavy steps coming from inside the hole on the wall. The warmth on my belly felt uncompromising, violent, unyielding, uncontrollable but most of all, blazing. Steam escaped my mouth. Okay. Let's finish this. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part 3.